the new girl at saint chad's a story of school life by dot angela brazil chapter one honor introduces herself any new girls it was madge summers who asked the question seated on the right-hand corner of Maisie talbot's bed munching caramels it was a very small bed but at that moment it managed to accommodate no less than seven of Maisie's most particular friends who were closely watching the progress of her unpacking and discussing the latest school news interspersed with remarks on her belongings Maisie extricated herself from the depths of her box and handed a pile of stockings to lettuce her younger sister what's the use of asking me she replied our cab only drove up half an hour ago i feel almost new myself yet so do i and horribly in the blues too said pauline reynolds it's always a wrench to leave home i'm perfectly miserable for at least three days at the beginning of each term i feel as if oh don't all begin to expatiate about your feelings broken chatty burns we know pauline's symptoms only too well the first day she shows aggressively red eyes and a damp pocket handkerchief the second day she writes lengthy letters home begging to be allowed to return immediately and have lessons with a private governess the third day she wanders about trying to get sympathy from anyone who is weak-minded enough to listen to her till in desperation somebody drags her into the playground and makes her have a round at hockey that cheers her up and she begins to think life isn't quite such a desert by the fourth morning she has recovered her spirits and come to the conclusion that chessington college is a very decent kind of place and she begins to be alarmed lest her mother on the strength of the pathetic letter should have decided to let her leave at once and should have already engaged a private governess you're most unsympathetic chatty said pauline smiling in spite of herself you don't know what it is to be homesick i wouldn't parade such a woe-begone face whatever might be the depths of my misery returned chatty briskly i'm always glad to come back declared dorothy arkwright i like school it's fun to meet everybody again and arrange about cricket and the debating society and the natural history club there's so much going on at st chad's no one has answered my question yet remarked madge summers are there any new girls chatty wriggled herself into a more comfortable position between adeline vaughn and ruth latimer i think there are about a dozen altogether vivian holmes says there are four at st bride's three at st aldwitha's two at the schoolhouse and two at st hilary's i saw one of them arriving at the same time as i did and miss cavendish was gushing over another in the library and marion spencer has brought a sister she introduced her to me just now but what about st chad's we've only one i believe though flossie taylor the hammond smith's cousin has moved here from st bride's she was always destined for a chadite you know only there wasn't room for her till the richardsons left she's no great acquisition said dorothy arkwright i hate girls to change their quarters when once they start at a house they ought to stick to it well she wants to be with her cousins i suppose put in madge summers who's our new girl i don't know i haven't heard anything about her perhaps she hasn't arrived yet s h s h said pauline reynolds squeezing madge's arm by way of remonstrance and pointing to the closely drawn curtains of the cubicle at the farther end of the room she's here now where there you goose what has she shut herself up like that for how should i know perhaps she's unpacking suggested dorothy arkwright if she is she'll finish it quicker than lettuce and i can 
returned Maisie Talbot. Why can't you be hanging up some of those skirts instead of sitting staring at me? Yes, this is a whole box of Edinburgh rock, but you shan't have a single piece. Any of you, unless you get off my bed at once. Poor old Maisie, don't grow excited, murmured Ruth Latimer, appropriating the box and handing it round, though no one attempted to move. But look here. What about this new girl? persisted Match. Hasn't anybody seen her? No. She's been in there ever since she arrived. Don't talk so loud. She'll hear you. I don't care if she does. I want to know what she's doing. I can tell you. Then, said Chatty Burns, in a whisper that was more audible by far than her ordinary voice. What? Crying. New girls always cry. And some old ones, too, if you take Pauline as a specimen. I'm not crying now, protested Pauline indignantly. And how can you tell that the new girl is? I'm as certain as if I'd proved a proposition in Euclid. Why should she have drawn her curtains so closely? If she's not lying on her bed with a clean pocket handkerchief to her eyes. I'll give you six caramels in exchange for three peppermint creams. Then you're just mistaken, cried a voice from the end cubicle. The chintz curtain was pulled aside, and out marched a figure with so jaunty an air as to banish utterly the idea of possible homesickness or tears. It was a girl of about fifteen, a remarkably pretty girl. So her schoolmates decided, without an instant's hesitation, and rather out of the common. She had a clear, olive complexion, a lovely color in her cheeks, a bewitching pair of dimples, and a perfect colt's mane of thick, curly, brown hair. Perhaps her nose was a little too tip-tilted, and her mouth a trifle too wide for absolute beauty, but she showed such a nice row of even. White teeth when she laughed that one could overlook the latter deficiency. Her eyes were beyond praise, large and gray, with a dark line round the iris, and shaded by long lashes. And they were so soft and wistful and winning, and yet so twinkling and full of fun, that they seemed as if they could compel admiration and make friends with their first glance. The girl walked across the room in an easy, confident fashion and stood, with a broad smile on her face, beaming at the seven others seated on Maisie's bed. Why shouldn't I pull my curtains? She asked. If I'd been pulling faces, now, you might have had some cause for complaint. You look rather a nice set. I think I'm going to like you. The girls were so surprised that they could only stare. It seemed reversing the usual order of things for a newcomer, who ought to be shy and confused, to be so absolutely and entirely self-possessed, and to pass judgment with such calm assurance upon these old members of St. Chad's, some of whom were already in their third year at Chessington College. Perhaps I'd better introduce myself, continued the stranger. My name is Honor Fitzgerald, and I come from Kilmore near Balikrigan, in County Kerry. Then you're Irish, gasped Chatty Burns. Quite right. First class for geography. County Kerry is exactly in the bottom left-hand corner of the map of Ireland. It's a more hospitable place than this is. I've been here nearly two hours, and nobody has offered me any refreshments yet. I'm simply starving. She looked so humorously and suggestively at the Edinburgh rock that Madge Summers promptly offered it to her, regardless of the fact that the box belonged to Maisie Talbot. Come along here, said Ruth Latimer, trying to make a place for the new girl on the bed by pushing the others vigorously nearer the end. No room unless I sit on your knee while you get up and walk about, declared Honor. There. I knew you would, as Madge Summers fell with a crash onto the floor. Seven little schoolgirls, eating sugar sticks, 
one tumbled overboard, and then there were six. Thank you. I think I prefer to take the chair, as the dentist says. There only seems to be one in each cubicle, but as I'm the visitor, take care, screamed Maisie. My clean glasses. What am I doing? I declare. I never saw them. There, I'll nurse them for you while I eat this delicious-looking piece of pink rock. The new girl was so utterly different from anybody else who had ever come to ST. Chats that the others waited with curiosity to hear what she would say next. Well, she inquired coolly at last. I suppose you're thinking me over. I should like to know your opinion of me. They tell me at home that my nose turns up and my tongue is too long. But I didn't turn up my nose at the Edinburgh Rock, did I? And as for my tongue, it fits my mouth as a general rule. Though it runs away sometimes. When did you come? What class are you in? Have you seen Miss Cavendish yet? How old are you? Have you been to school before? Do you know anyone here? Why did you come to St. Chad's? The questions were fired off all together from seven pairs of lips. One at a time, please, returned honor. I'm older than I look and younger than I seem. You may have believed me, yet I assure you I've only had three birthdays. Rubbish, said Chatty Burns. It's a fact all the same. But how could that be, demanded Pauline Reynolds incredulously. Because I was born on the 29th of February, and I can't have a birthday except in a leap year. That accounts for anything odd there is about me. So if you find me queer, you must just say, she's a 29th of February girl and make excuses for me. As for the other questions, I've never been to school before. I've seen Miss Cavendish. But I haven't heard yet what class I'm to be in. Five minutes ago, I didn't know anybody here. But now I know. How many are there of you? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Have you unpacked yet? Asked Maisie, returning to her box, which Lettuce had been steadily emptying. Only about half. I think we had better come and help you then. Better finish our own first, grunted Lettuce, for which remark she was promptly snubbed by her elder sister. Miss Maitland will be up at eight o'clock to look at our drawers, said Chatty Burns. She'll expect you to have everything put away and your coats and dresses hung in the wardrobe. We have to be so fearfully tidy here, sighed Adeline Vaughn. A warden comes round each morning, and woe betide you if you leave hairs in your brush or have forgotten to fold your nightdress. It's just as bad at St. Hilary, said Match. And worse at St. Brides, added Ruth Latimer. My father wanted me to be at the schoolhouse, said Honor, but Miss Cavendish wrote that it was full, so I was entered at St. Chad's instead. Yes! You generally need to have your name down for two years before you can get a vacancy at the schoolhouse, said Dorothy Arkwright. It's the popular favorite with parents. Because Miss Cavendish herself is the head, but really, St. Chad's is far nicer. We all stand up for our own house, and I know you'll like it. There's the tea bell. Come along. We must go at once. Interrupted Chatty Burns. Won't they wait for us? inquired Honor, beginning to wash her hands with much deliberation. Wait. She asks if they'll wait, exclaimed Adeline Vaughn. One can see you've never been to school before, commented Maisie Talbot. No, you certainly haven't time to comb your hair now. You had better follow the rest of us as fast as you can. St. Chads could accommodate forty pupils, and Honor found a place assigned to her in the dining hall near the end of a long table, which looked very attractive with its clean white cloth, its pretty china, and its vases of flowers in the middle. She had a good view of her schoolfellows, more than half of whom seemed of about the same age as herself. Though there were tall girls, with their hair already put up, 
and a few younger ones who had apparently only just entered their teens. Grace was sung, and then the urns began to fill an almost ceaseless stream of cups, while plates of bread and butter circulated with much rapidity. We're late today, explained Honor's neighbor, because the train from the north does not get in until five. Our usual tea time is four o'clock after games. Then we have supper at half past seven, when we've finished evening preparation. Did you bring any jam? Your hamper will be unpacked tomorrow, and the pots labeled with your name. I expect you'll find one opposite your plate at breakfast. Jam and marmalade are the only things we're allowed, except plain cakes. Tea on the first afternoon was generally an exciting occasion at St. Chad's. There were so many greetings between old friends, so much news, and such various topics to be discussed, that conversation, in a sufficiently subdued undertone, went on very briskly. The girls had enjoyed their Easter holidays, but most of them seemed pleased to return to school, for the summer term was always the favorite at Chessington College. Have you heard who's in the eleven? began Madge Summers. They've actually put in Grace Shaw, and she bowls abominably. I think it's rank favoritism on Miss Young's part. She always gives us tea. Hillary's a turn when she can. She was a Hilaryite herself, returned Adeline Vaughn. That's the worst of having a games mistress who's been educated at the school. She's sure to show partiality for her old house. And yet in one way it's better, because she understands all our customs and private rules. It would be almost impossible to explain everything to a newcomer. What about the house team? asked Ruth Latimer. Is anything fixed? Not yet. There's to be a practice tomorrow. And it will go by our scores. I shall stick to tennis, declared Pauline Reynolds. One gets a fair chance there at any rate, and we must keep up the credit of St. Chad's in the courts. I don't know whether we've any chance of winning the shield. I wish we could get a real champion. You should see Flossie Taylor play, burst out Edith and Claudia Hammond Smith who were anxious to bring their cousin forward and to ensure her popularity among the other girls. I've not heard that she made any record at St. Bride's, remarked Dorothy Arkwright, who resented Flossie's removal to St. Chad's. She hasn't had an opportunity. She only came to school last Christmas, and it wasn't the tennis season. Wait till you see her serve. Miss Young will have to be judge, not I, replied Dorothy coldly. Flossie is in your bedroom, Dorothy, announced Claudia. She has the cubicle near the fireplace. If you're sleeping in the bed next to mine, said Flossie, eyeing Dorothy across the table with a rather patronizing air, I sincerely hope you don't snore. Of course not, responded Dorothy, in some indignation. At St. Bride's, continued Flossie, one of my roommates snored atrociously. I used to have to get up and shake her and pull the pillow from under her head before I could go to sleep. You'd better not try that on with me. I would in a minute if you kept me awake. It is a shame she's not in our room, interposed Edith. We've asked Miss Maitland to let her change with Geraldine Saunders, and I think perhaps she may. We want Flossie all to ourselves. I do hope she'll let us. So do I, retorted Dorothy feelingly. The Hammond Smiths are welcome to their cousin, so far as I'm concerned. She whispered to Chatty Burns. I don't like her. She's trying to show off. Edith and Claudia are making far too much fuss over her. They always gush, commented Chatty. Still, I dare say Flossie will need taking down a little. It would do her all the good in the world, replied Dorothy. Then, turning to the Hammond Smiths, she remarked aloud, There's a new girl here who may be just as good as your cousin. For anything we know. Honor Fitzgerald, do you play tennis? 
I can play, but how you'll like it is another story, answered Honor. We too, nodding at Flossie, had better try a set by ourselves. And then you can choose the winner. I'm sure I don't care about it, thank you. Flossie's tone was supercilious. All right. We don't force ourselves where we're not wanted in my part of the world. Is that Ireland? Then I suppose your name is Biddy. Certainly not. I thought all Irish girls were called Biddy. Are you sure you're not? My name is Honor Fitzgerald. Really? I'm astonished it isn't Mulligan or O'Grady. The Hammondsmiths giggled and poked Effie and Blanche Lawson. Isn't Flossie funny? They whispered delightedly. I think she's very rude, observed Dorothy Arkwright. I call that an extremely cheap form of wit. Irish names are often rather peculiar, drawled Claudia Hammondsmith. They're quite as good as English ones. And sometimes a great deal more ancient and aristocratic, returned honor. One for Claudia and for Flossie Taylor, too, said Dorothy to Chatty Burns. Patty, for instance, interposed Flossie, who saw that the Lawsons were listening as well as her cousins. St. Patrick and pigs always go together, in my mind. I suppose you keep a pig in Ireland. Don't answer her, whispered Honor's neighbor. They're only teasing you because you're new. They want to see how much you'll stand. But poor Honor was unaccustomed as yet to schoolgirl banter, and could not abstain from replying, Does it matter whether we do or not? She spoke quietly, but there was a gleam in her eye, as if her temper were rising. Not in the least. I only thought all Irish people cultivated pigs. It's no worse than keeping a cat or a dog. My dear Patty, of course not. Still, I shouldn't care to have the creatures in the drawing room. Take a little more bread and butter. I'm sorry we've no potatoes to offer you. The Hammond Smiths and the Lawsons tittered. And Dorothy Arkwright was about to state her frank opinion of their behavior when Honor's pent-up wrath exploded. We don't keep pigs in the drawing room, she exclaimed. There's a saying that it takes nine tailors to make a man, so if your name is Taylor, you can only be the ninth part of a lady. Then... Realizing that her upraised voice had drawn upon her the attention, not only of all the girls, but also of Miss Maitland, she flushed crimson, scraped back her chair, and fled precipitately from the room. Miss Maitland looked surprised. It was an unheard of thing for any girl to leave the tea table without permission. Such a breach of school decorum had surely never been committed before at St. Chad's. There was a very complete code of etiquette observed at the house, and to break one of the laws of politeness was considered an unpardonable offense. She's made a bad beginning, whispered Ruth Latimer to Maisie Talbot. It's most unfortunate. It was really the fault of Flossie Taylor and the Hammondsmiths. They needn't have teased her so. Still, it was silly of her to lose her temper, replied Maisie. She stalked out of the room like a queen of tragedy. Miss Maitland can't bear girls who give way to their impulses. She despises what she calls early Victorian hysterics. And I quite agree with her. Yes, we must learn to be stoics here, said Ruth. And as for teasing... The wisest thing is to take no notice of it. A monitress had been dispatched to fetch on her back. But in a short time she returned alone and reported that she could not find her. Miss Maitland made no comment, and as the meal was now over she gave the signal of dismissal. Most of the girls went to the recreation room, but Maisie Talbot, who had not yet quite concluded her unpacking, ran straight upstairs. Noticing something move behind a curtain in the corner of the bedroom, she pulled it aside. There was Honor, sitting in a queer little heap on the floor, and rubbing her eyes in a very suggestive manner. She jumped up in a moment, however, 
and pretended that she was only arranging her boots. I'd finish tea, she remarked airily. So I thought I might as well empty my box and put my dresses away in my wardrobe. You'll have to ask Miss Maitland's leave next time, before you march out of the room, or you'll get into trouble. Said Maisie, If it weren't your first evening, you'd be expected to make a public apology. Of course, Flossie Taylor and the Hammond Smiths were aggravating. But you should just have laughed at them, and then they'd have stopped. We don't behave like kindergarten children here. Maisie spoke scathingly. She was a girl who had scant sympathy with what she called babbyishness and disliked any exhibition of feeling. And after all, she only voiced the general opinion of the school, which, by an unwritten law, had established a calm imperturbation as the height of good breeding. I don't care in the least what any of you think, retorted Honor. And she hung up her skirt with such a jerk that she broke the loop. Yet, although she spoke lightly, she evidently did care. She was very quiet indeed all the rest of the evening, and hardly spoke at recreation. Chatty Burns sat down next to her and tried to begin a conversation, but Honor answered so briefly that she very soon gave up the effort in despair and moved away, while the other girls were so interested in their own affairs that they did not trouble to remember their new schoolfellow. At nine o'clock prayers were read, and everybody went upstairs to bed. When the lights were out and the room was in perfect silence, a strange, suppressed noise issued from Honor's corner. It might, of course, have been snoring, and Honor explained elaborately next morning that Irish people often have a peculiar way of breathing in their sleep an affection from which she sometimes suffered herself. All the same, I don't quite believe her, confided Pauline Reynolds, who occupied the next cubicle to Lettuce Talbot. A more sympathetic character than her sister, Maisie. I know what it is to feel homesick and to smother one's nose in the pillow. If that wasn't sobbing, it was as like it as anything I've ever heard in my life. Chapter 2 Honor's Home For a full understanding of Honor Fitzgerald, we must go back a few weeks and see her in that Irish home which was so far away and so utterly different from Chessington College. Kilmore Castle was a great, rambling, old-fashioned country house, built beside an inland creek of the sea and sheltered by a range of hills from the wild winds of Kerry. To honor that was the dearest and most beautiful spot in the world. She loved every inch of it, the silvery strips of water that led between bold, rocky headlands out to the broad Atlantic. The tall mountain peaks that showed so rugged an outline against the sky, the brown, peat-stained river that came brawling down from the uplands and poured itself noisily into the creek, the wide, lonely moors, with their stretches of brilliant green grass and dark, treacherous bog pools, and the craggy cliffs that made a barrier against the ever-dashing waves and round which thousands of seabirds flew, with harsh cries and were of white wings. Its situation at the end of a long peninsula made Kilmore Castle an isolated little kingdom of its own. On the shore stood a row of low, fishermen's whitewashed cabins, dignified by the name of the village, but otherwise there was no human habitation in sight, and Bolikrigan, the market town and nearest postal, railway, and telegraph station, was ten miles off. Trees were rarities at Kilmore, a few stunted specimens, all blown one way by the prevailing gale, grew as if huddled together for protection at the foot of the glen. But they were the exception that proved the rule. Nevertheless, under the sheltering walls of the castle Mrs. Fitzgerald had managed to acclimatize some exotic shrubs, and to cultivate quite a beautiful garden of flowers, 
for the temperature was uniformly mild, though the winds were boisterous. Brilliant St. Bridget's anemones, the poet's narcissus, tulips, jonquils, and hyacinths bloomed here almost as early as in the Silly Isles and made patches of fragrant brightness under the sitting room windows. While in the crannies of the walls might be seen delicate maidenhair and other ferns, too tender generally to stand a winter in the open. Born and bred in this faraway corner of the world, Honor had grown up almost a child of nature. Her whole life had been spent as much as possible out of doors, boating, fishing, or swimming in the creek, driving in a low-backed car over the rough carry roads, galloping her shaggy little pony on the moors, following the otter hounds up the river, and sharing in any sport that her father considered suitable for her age and sex. She was the only girl among five brothers, and in her mother's opinion was by far the most difficult to manage of the whole flock. All the wild Irish blood of the family seemed to have settled in her, the high spirits, the fire, the pride, the quick temper, the impatience of control, the happy-go-lucky, idle, irresponsible ways of a long line of hot-headed ancestors had skipped a generation or two, and, as if they had been bottling themselves up during the interval, had reappeared with renewed force in this particular specimen of the Fitzgerald race. She's more trouble than the five boys put together, her mother often declared, and her friends cordially agreed with her. Mrs. Fitzgerald herself was a mild, quiet, nervous, delicate lady. As much astonished at her lively, tempestuous daughter as a meek little hedge sparrow would be that had hatched a young cuckoo. Frankly, she did not understand honor, who's strong. Uncontrolled character differed so entirely from her own gentle, clinging, dependent disposition and whose storms of grief or anger. Wild fits of waywardness and equally passionate repentance and self-willed disobedience, alternating with sudden bursts of reformation, were a constant source of worry and anxiety and the direct opposite of her ideal of girlhood. Poor Mrs. Fitzgerald would have liked a docile, tractable daughter who would have been content to sit beside her sofa doing fancy work instead of riding to hounds, and who would have had more consideration for her weak state of health. She appreciated Honor's warm-hearted affection to the full, but at the same time wished she could make her realize that rough hugs, boisterous kisses, and loud tones were hardly suitable to an invalid. Suffering as she was from a painful and incurable complaint, it was sometimes impossible for her to admit honor to her sick room, and for weeks together the girl would hardly see her mother. It was through no lack of love that honor had failed to give that service and tenderness which, in the circumstances, an only daughter might so fitly have rendered. It was from sheer want of thought and general heedlessness. Some girls early acquire a sense of responsibility and care for others, but in honor these qualities were as undeveloped as in a child of six. Many were the governesses who had attempted to tame the young rebel and bring her into a state of law and order, but all had been equal failures. She had learnt lessons when she felt inclined and left them undone when she was idle and she had managed to make life in the schoolroom such a purgatory that it had been difficult to persuade any teacher to stay long at the castle and cope with so thankless a task as her education. It had been of little use to complain to her father, the only person in the world whose authority she recognized. He was proud of his handsome daughter, and, except when her temper crossed his own, was apt to indulge her in most of her whims. Matters had at last, however, come to a crisis. 
an act of more than usual assumption on honour's part had aroused major fitzgerald's utmost indignation and had caused him suddenly to decide that she was spoiling at home and that the only possible solution of the difficulty was to dispatch her to school as soon as the necessary arrangements could be made for her departure the incident that led to this resolution was very characteristic of honor's headstrong impulsive nature she was passionately fond of horses and for some time had been anxious to possess a new pony it was not that she loved pixie her former favorite any the less but he was growing old and was now scarcely able to take offence or carry her in mad career over the moors being only fit for a sober trot on the high road or to draw her mother's bath chair round the garden to obtain a strong well-bred fiery substitute for pixie was the summit of honour's ambition one day when she was with her father at Balikrigan, she saw exactly the realization of her ideal it was a small black cob which showed a trace of arab blood in its arching neck slender limbs and easy springy motion though its bright eyes proved its high spirit it was nevertheless as gentle as a lamb and well accustomed to carrying a lady its owner a local horse-dealer was anxious to sell it and pressed major fitzgerald to take it as a bargain honor simply fell in love with it on the spot she ascertained that its name was firefly and begged and besought her father to buy it for her but on this occasion he would not yield even to her utmost coaxing he did not wish to keep another pony in the stable and he considered the price asked was excessive and entirely beyond the present limits of his purse no honor it can't be done he said you must be content with poor old pixie i have quite enough expenses just now without running into such an extravagance but couldn't i have it instead of something else pleaded honor there's nothing we could knock off dear child replied her father i could do without a governess suggested honor hopefully i'd set myself my own lessons and learn them too oh daddy darling if we gave up miss barry wouldn't you have money enough to buy firefly major fitzgerald laughed in spite of himself i consider miss barry a necessity and not a luxury he replied a governess is the very last person we could dispense with i should like to see you setting your own lessons remarkably short and easy ones they would be no little woman i'm afraid firefly is an impossibility and you must just try to forget his existence unfortunately that was exactly what honor could not do she thought continually about the beautiful black cob and the more she dwelt on her disappointment the more keenly she felt it she considered most unreasonably that her governess was the alternative of the pony and that if she were without the one she might possibly acquire the other her behavior had never been exemplary but on the strength of this grievance she grew so unruly so disrespectful and so absolutely unmanageable that miss barry at length refused to teach her any longer and after an interview with major fitzgerald in the library packed her boxes and returned home to england honor viewed her exodus with keen delight it seemed the removal of an obstacle to her plan she went into luncheon determined to broach once more the subject of firefly hoping this time to meet with better success she saw at once however from her father's face that he was not in a suitable mood to grant her any favor he was much annoyed at the governess's departure for which he had the justice to blame honor alone and he was worried with business matters that tiresome agent has not sent the telegram i expected he announced i shall be obliged to go over to cork to consult my solicitor 
Tell Murphy to have the trap ready by two o'clock and let Holmes pack my bag. I shall probably be away until Friday evening. As soon as her father had started for the station, Honor sauntered out in the direction of the stables. It was one of her mother's bad days. Mrs. Fitzgerald was confined to her room, therefore Honor, released from Miss Barry's authority, felt herself her own mistress. Finding Fergus, the groom, she ordered him to saddle Pixie and make ready to accompany her on a ride. Fergus was devoted to Miss Honor, and would never have dreamt of disputing any command she might give him. Before three o'clock, therefore, her pony was at the door, and, dressed in her neat blue habit, she was ambling away in the direction of Bolikrigan. It was a leisurely progress, for poor Pixie's gait was slow, in spite of his best endeavors and Honor loved him too well to urge him hard. She was determined to call at the horse dealers and to ascertain if Firefly were still for sale. Perhaps, when her father returned home, she might catch him at a favorable moment and be able to cajole him into changing his mind and buying the cob. Mr. O'Connor, the horse dealer, lived at a large farm on the way to the town, and... To Honor's intense delight, the first object that met her eyes on approaching the house was Firefly, feeding demurely in a paddock to the left of the road. By an equally lucky chance, Mr. O'Connor happened to be at home, and came hurrying out at once when he saw, one of the quality, as he expressed it, drawing bridle at his door. Good afternoon. I see you still have the black cob began Honor eagerly. Yes, Missy, replied the horse dealer, and I was thinking of sending a message to your father about him this very day. It's the good fortune to see you here. I've had a man over from Limerick who's anxious to take him, a tradesman who'd run him in a light cart, but I didn't close the bargain at once. I said to my wife, Firefly is too good a breed to carry out groceries. I'd rather be for selling him to the castle. Miss Fitzgerald took the fancy for him, and I'll not be parting with him till I've had word again from the major. Maybe his honor will be wanting him, after all? But sure I must know at once. For the Limerick man will be here at noon tomorrow, and I've promised to tell him one way or another. Could you possibly wait until Saturday? asked Honor. The dealer shook his head. I can't afford to miss a sale, he replied. I've had the cob on my hands for some time. It's just eating its head off, and it's anxious I am to get rid of it. Honor was in a fever of excitement. Firefly. So spirited and so aristocratic, whose delicately shaped limbs looked only fit for leaping brooks or cantering over the short grass on the uplands to be sold to a tradesman and to run between the shafts of a cart that delivered groceries. It seemed a degradation and an outrage. She could not dream of allowing it. She must save him at any cost from such a fate. Must you absolutely have an answer today? She asked. Yes, Missy. I fear I couldn't put off Sullivan any longer than noon tomorrow. He's a touchy man and ready to carry his business elsewhere. Very well, then, that settles the matter. We will take the cob. You may send him over to the castle this evening. Honor concludes the purchase of Firefly Honor concludes the purchase of Firefly Honor spoke in such a high-handed manner that the dealer never guessed she was acting on her own authority. As she had made a special visit to the farm, accompanied by her groom, he imagined she must have been entrusted by Major Fitzgerald with full powers to buy the pony if she wished. Many thanks to you, Missy. It's the fine mistress you'll make for Firefly. My respects to his honor, and the price shall be the same as I was asking him before. The price? Honor had quite forgotten that. Weighed against Firefly's possible future, 
It had seemed an unimportant detail. She remembered now, however, that her father had considered it extravagant and declared he could not afford it. The thought was sufficient to check her joy suddenly and to send her home in a sober frame of mind that was well justified by the sequel. Major Fitzgerald's wrath, when he arrived on the Friday and found the black cob installed in the stable, was more serious than his daughter had ever experienced before. It was a piece of unwarranted presumption, he declared. I shall not allow you to keep the pony. It must be sent back to O'Connor's and resold at the first opportunity. As for you, the sooner you are packed off to school, the better. We have indulged you too much at home, and it is time indeed that you learn to submit to some kind of discipline. The proposal to send her away to school was a terrible blow to honor. At first she appealed to her mother, begging her to plead with her father and try to persuade him to alter his resolution. But Mrs. Fitzgerald, while regretting to part with her troublesome daughter, was so convinced of the wisdom of the proceeding that, instead of interceding, she applauded her husband's decision. I can't ever like England, sobbed Honor. I'd rather have our mountains and lakes and bogs than all the grand streets and houses. I'm Irish to the core, and I don't believe any school over the water can change me. There's no place in the world like Kilmore. I love even the cabins and the peat fires and the pigs and the potatoes. I shan't forget a single stick or stone of it. And I shall never know a moment's happiness till I'm home again. After considerable hesitation and the examination of a large number of prospectuses, Major and Mrs. Fitzgerald had determined to send honor to Chessington College. It had a wide and well-deserved reputation, and Miss Cavendish, the principal, was understood to give much individual attention to the characters and dispositions of her pupils. Added to this, it was situated within a few miles of the Naval Preparatory School where Dermot, Honor's younger brother, had been for the last two years, so that they knew from experience that the neighborhood was bracing and healthy. It's a comfort, at any rate, that I shall be near Dermot, said Honor. As she sat watching while her mother superintended the maid who was packing her boxes, I'm afraid you won't see much of him, dear, during term time, replied Mrs. Fitzgerald. He will not be able to visit you, I'm sure. Neither will Miss Cavendish allow you to go out with him. Why not? demanded Honor because it would be against the rules. Then the rules are absurd. And I shan't keep them. Honor, honor, don't speak like that. You have run wild here, but at Chessington College you will be obliged to fall in with the ordinary regulations. They'll have hard work to tame me, mother, laughed Honor, jumping up and dancing a little impromptu jig between the boxes. I don't want to go, but since I must. I mean to get any enjoyment I can out of it. After all, perhaps it may be rather fun. It's deadly dull here sometimes, when the boys are at school and father is busy or away. Mrs. Fitzgerald sighed. In her delicate health, she could scarcely expect to be a companion for honor, yet when she thought of how few years might be left them together— the parting seemed bitter, and she was hurt that her only daughter would evidently miss her so little. Young folks often say cruel things from mere thoughtlessness, and unintentionally grieve those who love them. In after years honor would keenly regret her tactless speech, and blame herself that she had not spent more hours in trying to be a comfort instead of a care, but for the present— Though she noticed the look of disappointment that passed over the sensitive face, she did not fully realize its cause, and the words that might have healed the wound went unspoken. At length the preparations were concluded, 
and the time had almost arrived to bid farewell to Kilmore Castle and the surrounding domain. Honor's friends in the village mourned her approaching departure with characteristic Irish grief. Miss Honor, darlint, it's myself that will be hung Erin for a sight of yes, cried old Mary O'Grady, standing at the doorway of her thatched cabin from which the blue peat smoke issued like a thin mist. And it's grand news and twirly they'll be off her tellin' me too. That year lavin the castle and goin' over the seas, put in Biddy McCarthy, a next-door neighbor of Mary's. It's fine to think of all the elegant things ye'll be seein' now. Bless your bright eyes, it's many a sad heart ye'll lave behind yes, added Pat Connolly, the oldest tenant on the estate. England can never compare with dear Ireland, in my opinion, replied Honor with a choke in her voice. There's no spot so sweet as Kilmore, and all the while I'm away I shall be wishing myself back in the ruled country. Will ye be disfizen this bit of a present, Miss Honor? said old Mary, producing a cardboard box, from which, out of many folds of tissue paper, she proudly displayed a large bunch of imitation four-leaved shamrock. My grandson Mickey brought it for me all the way from Dublin City, and I've kept it fine and new in its papers. Sure, I know it's not worthy of off Aaron to a young lady like yourself, but I'll take it kindly if ye'll deign to accept it. Of course I'll accept it, returned Honor heartily. It's very kind of you to give it to me. It shall go to school with me as a remembrance of Ireland and of you all. The four-leaved shamrock brings good luck to its wearer, Mavernine. May it bring it to you. And whenever you look at the little green leaves, give a thought to the true hearts that will be I wishin' ye a speedy return. The last day came all too soon, and Mrs. Fitzgerald, with tears in her eyes, stood at her window, watching the disappearing carriage in which Honor sat by her father's side, waving an energetic goodbye. Surely, she said to herself, school will have the influence that we expect. The general atmosphere of law and order, the well-arranged rules, the esprit de corps and strict discipline of the games, all cannot fail to have their effect, and among so large a number of companions. And in the midst of so many new and absorbing interests, my wild bird will find her wings clipped, and will settle down sensibly and peaceably among the others. Chapter 3 The Wearing of the Green Chessington College stood on a breezy slope midway between the hills and the sea, and about a mile from the rising watering place of Dunscar. It was a famous spot for a school, as the fresh winds coming either from the uplands or from the wide expanse of channel were sufficient to blow away all chance of germs, and to ensure a thoroughly wholesome and bracing atmosphere. The college prided itself upon its record of health. Miss Cavendish considered no other girls were so straight and well-grown as hers, with such bright eyes, such clear skins, and such blooming cheeks. Ventilation, sea baths, and suitable diet were her three watchwords, and thanks to them the sanatorium at the farther side of the shrubbery scarcely ever opened its doors to receive a patient, while the hospital nurse, who was retained in case of emergencies, found her position a sinecure. The buildings were modern and up-to-date, with all the latest appliances and improvements. They were provided with steam heat and electric light, and the gymnasium, chemical laboratory, and practical demonstration kitchen were on the very newest of educational lines. The school covered a large space and was built in the form of a square. In the middle was a great, graveled quadrangle, where hockey could be practiced on days when the fields were too wet for playing. At one end stood the big lecture hall, the chapel, the library, and the various classrooms, the whole surmounted by a handsome clock tower, 
while opposite was the schoolhouse, where Miss Cavendish herself presided over a chosen fifty of her two hundred pupils. The two sides of the square were occupied by four houses, named respectively St. Aldwitha's, St. Hillary's, St. Chad's, and St. Bride's, each being in charge of a mistress and capable of accommodating from thirty to forty girls, though the whole school met together every day for lessons. The members of each different house resembled a separate family and were keenly anxious to maintain the honor of their particular establishment. Miss Cavendish did not wish to excite rivalry, yet she thought a spirit of friendly emulation was on the whole salutary and encouraged matches between the various house teams or competitions among the choral and debating societies. The rules for all were exactly similar. Every morning, at a quarter to seven, a clanging bell rang in the passages for a sufficient length of time to disturb even the soundest of slumbers. Breakfast was at half past seven, and at half past eight everybody was due in chapel for a short service. Lectures and classes occupied the morning from nine till one, and the afternoon was devoted to games. Tea was at four, and supper at half past seven, with preparation in between, and after that hour came sewing and recreation until bedtime. It was a well arranged and reasonable division of time, calculated to include right proportions of work and play. Mensana in corpore sano was Miss Cavendish's favorite motto, and the clean bill of health, the successes in examinations, and the high moral tone that prevailed throughout pointed to the fulfillment of her ideal. Most of the girls were thoroughly happy at Chessington College, and, though it is in girl nature to grumble at rules and lessons, there was scarcely one who would have cared to leave it if she had been given the opportunity. It was to this new, interesting, and exciting world of school that Honor unclosed her eyes on the morning after her arrival. She opened them sleepily, and, I regret to say, promptly shut them again, and turned over comfortably in bed, regardless of the vigorous bell that was delivering its warning in the passage. Punctuality had not been counted a cardinal virtue at Kilmore Castle, and she saw no special necessity for rising until she felt inclined. She had just dropped off again into a delicious doze when once more her peace was rudely disturbed. The curtain of her cubicle was drawn back, and three lively faces made their appearance. Look here. Don't you know it's time to get up? said Maisie Talbot. Administering a vigorous poke that would have roused the seven sleepers of legendary lore and caused even honor to yawn. You'll be fined a penny if you're late for breakfast. Added lettuce, and that's a very unsatisfactory way of disposing of one's pocket money. And makes Miss Maitland particularly irate, said Pauline Reynolds. Honor Fitzgerald. Do you intend to get up, or do you not? Because if you don't, we shall have to try cold pig. Then, as there were no signs of movement... Lettuce carried out her threat by dabbing a wet sponge full in Honor's face, while at the same moment Maisie wrenched back the bedclothes with a relentless hand. We're doing you a real kindness, so you needn't be cross, Miss Patty Pepperbox, said Lettuce. Just wait till you've seen Miss Maitland scowl at a late comer, and you'll give us a vote of thanks. I'm not cross, said Honor laughing in spite of the violation of her slumbers. Lettuce spoke so merrily, it was impossible to take offense, even at the nickname. But I think you use rather summary measures. The sponge was horribly cold and nasty. It's the only way to get people to bestir themselves, said Lettuce complacently. I've had experience with sleepy roommates before. We always try the water cure at St. Chad's, added Maisie. We've given you quite mild treatment, as it was a first case. We might have used your bedroom jug instead of a sponge. Owing to her companion's efforts, 
honor was in time for breakfast a fortunate circumstance for her as after the episode at the tea table on the preceding evening her housemistress would not have been ready to overlook any deficiency in punctuality there was always a short recess between breakfast and chapel which the girls called a breathing space and during which they could revise exercises sharpen lead pencils and take a last peep at lessons this morning everybody seemed to be assembling in the dressing room for this brief interval and their honor repaired with the others i hear you've been put in the lower third patty said lettuce talbot vivian holmes told me so just now it's my form Maisie and pauline are in it too isn't Maisie above you asked honor looking at the sisters the elder of whom overtopped the younger by nearly a head she is in inches at any rate i'm only a year older than lettuce though i am so much taller explained Maisie. i suppose i ought to be in a higher form but she always manages to catch me up i make up my mind every term i'm going to win a double remove and leave her behind yet somehow it never happens to come off i'm much better at cricket and hockey than at french and algebra but after all it's rather convenient to have her in the same form she's sure to remember what the lesson is when i forget and i can borrow her books if i lose my own yes i have to work for both complained lettuce Maisie won't even copy her exercise questions she always relies on me Maisie certainly made her younger sister useful she expected her to fetch and carry tidy both their cubicles and generally maintain a very subservient and inferior position on the other hand though she tyrannized over lettuce herself she would not allow anybody else to do so and was ready to take her part and fight her battles against the whole school i'm glad we're in the same class remarked honor with an approving glance at lettuce's round smiling face perhaps i shall ask you to copy the exercise questions too my memory is not particularly good where lessons are concerned who else is in the lower third ruth latimer my greatest chum we allow ourselves chums put in Maisie, but we're not at all romantic at chessington we don't swear eternal friendships and exchange locks of hair and walk about the college with our arms clasped round each other's necks and write each other sentimental notes with sweetest and darling and fondest love in them that's what miss maitland calls early victorian we're very matter-of-fact here still when we choose a chum we generally stick to her and don't go in for all that nonsense of getting out of friends or not speaking as they do at some schools honor was about to ask more questions but at that moment vivian holmes the monitress and head girl of the house came bustling into the room you haven't got your sailor and jersey yet honor fitzgerald she said miss maitland asked me to give them to you here they are both marked with your name so that they needn't be mixed up with anybody else's you're to take this hook and this compartment for your shoes and this locker to keep your books in i've put labels on them all honor looked without enthusiasm at the knitted woolen coat and with marked disfavor at the white sailor hat with its band of orange ribbon i can't wear that she ejaculated why not inquired vivian in surprise there's an orange band round it orange is the saint chad's color explained vivian we all have exactly the same hats at chessington but each house has its own special ribbon blue for the schoolhouse pink for saint aldwitha's scarlet for saint hillary's and violet for s t brides i thought you knew that already if i had i'd have insisted upon going to another house declared honor tragically you ask me to wear orange why the very name of orangeman sets my teeth on edge 
I'm a nationalist to the last drop of my blood. We all are down in Kerry. Vivian smiled. Don't be absurd, she said, in rather an offhand manner. Our hats have nothing whatever to do with politics. Here are two long pins, but if you prefer an elastic, you can stitch one on, and without deigning to argue further, she walked away. Honor stood turning the hat round and round, with a very queer expression on her face. She was a devoted daughter of Erin. Her country's former glories and the possible brilliance of its future as a separate kingdom could always provoke her wildest enthusiasm to be asked, therefore, to don the color which in her native land stood as the symbol of the union with England and for direct opposition to national independence seemed to her little short of an insult to her dear Emerald Isle. There were still five minutes left before she need start for chapel, so, making up her mind suddenly, she rushed upstairs to her bedroom. She would show these Saxons that she was a true Celt. They might compel her to wear their emblem of bondage, but it should be with an addition that would proclaim her patriotic sentiments to the world. Hurriedly hunting in her top drawer, she produced a yard of vivid green ribbon and the bunch of imitation shamrock that old Mary O'Grady had given her as a parting present. Then she set to work on a piece of amateur millinery. There was little time to use needle and thread, but with the aid of pins she managed to twist the ribbon into several loops and to fasten the shamrock conspicuously in front. She looked at the result of her labors with great approval. One could almost imagine it was St. Patrick's Day, she said to herself. Nobody could possibly mistake me now for a unionist. I'm labeled home rule as plainly as can be. Then, hastily pinning on her hat before the mirror, she ran downstairs. Humming under her breath, so we'll bide our time. Our banner yet and motto shall be seen, and voices shout the chorus out, the wherein o oh, the green. The girls at Chessington College were all dressed exactly alike, in a uniform costume of blue serge skirts, with blue or white cotton blouses for summer and flannel ones for winter. On Sundays they wore white serge coats and skirts, and for evenings white muslin or nuns veiling. They were allowed a little latitude in the way of embroideries with respect to best frocks, but their everyday, ordinary clothes were required to be of the school pattern. With the addition of sailor hats and knitted coats, for use in running across the quadrangle on wet or cold days, Miss Cavendish considered that this rule encouraged simplicity and provided against any undue extravagance in the matter of dress. She did not allow rings or bracelets to be worn, and the sole vanity permitted to the girls was in the choice of their hair ribbons. Punctually at twenty-five minutes past eight each morning the bell in the little chapel began to give warning, and by half-past every member of the school was expected to have taken her seat, and to be ready for the short service held there daily by the senior curate of the parish church at Dunscar. In twos and threes and small groups the girls came hurrying in answer to the call of the tinkling bell, though they laughed and talked as they ran across the quadrangle. They sobered down as they neared the door, and, each taking a prayer book from a pile laid ready in the porch, passed silently and reverently into the chapel. Every house had its own special rows of seats, and the sailor hats that mingled like a kaleidoscope in the grounds were here divided into their several sets of colors, though sometimes varied by a gleam of ruby or amber falling from the stained glass windows above. The singing was musical and the responses hearty. While into his five minutes' explanation of the lesson for the day the clergyman generally managed to compress much helpful thought, sending away some, at least, of his hearers braced up for the duties that awaited them. 
On this particular morning, anyone accustomed to the ordinary atmosphere of the place might have been aware that something of an unusual character was in the air. There was an undercurrent of unrest, a turning of heads, a subdued rustling, even an occasional whisper, and the headmistress, realizing at last that some outside cause must be distracting the minds of her pupils, glanced up and, following the direction of all eyes, saw a sight that filled her with unfeigned astonishment. Among the neat rows of orange-banded sailor hats in the benches marked St. Chad's was one trimmed with large and obtrusive knots of emerald green ribbon which drooped over the brim, while a bunch of imitation shamrock finished the front. It seemed to stand out so conspicuously from its fellows that it resembled a succulent palm tree growing in the midst of a sandy desert, and could not fail to attract the attention of the whole school. How such an irregularity had crept in amongst the uniforms of the college Miss Cavendish could not comprehend. It must form the subject of an after-inquiry, and in the meantime, stilling with a reproachful glance a faint whisper in her vicinity. She joined in the singing of a psalm with her usual clear intonation. When the service was over, however, and the girls began to file away in orderly line, she spoke a few. Rapid words to a monitress, who at once passed quickly out by a side door. As the extraordinary green hat made its appearance in the quadrangle, it was greeted with quite a buzz of excitement by the girls assembled outside. Only a few of them, comparatively. New honor by sight, and the rest were asking who she was and to which house she belonged. The common feeling was distinctly unfavorable. Apart from the unseemliness of such an exhibition in a sacred place, New girls were not expected to make themselves conspicuous or to introduce innovations. Either was considered an impertinence on their part, so the general verdict was that honor had done a dreadful thing and public opinion was dead against her. She, however, held up her head as proudly as though her absurd hat had been the latest creation from Bond Street. It's a tribute to my native land, she said airily in response to a chorus of questions. Sorry you don't like it, but it's my first attempt at hat trimming, and I flattered myself it wasn't bad for a beginner. St. Patrick forever. I made up my mind before I started that I'd keep up the credit of the shamrock on this side of the water, and I've done my best. Hurrah for old Ireland. Then, as if her feelings were absolutely too much for her, she took her skirt in her hands and began to dance an old-fashioned carry hornpipe, humming a lively Irish tune to supply the music. The girl stared in amazement at the mad performance. She's showing off, declared some, but others laughed and watched with a kind of fascination. For the dance was striking and original, and the movements were unusually graceful. Honor's triumph, however, was short-lived. Vivian Holmes forced her way through the crowd and, laying her hand on the shoulder of the obstreperous newcomer, told her to report herself at once in Miss Cavendish's study. The lookers-on scuttled away to their classes without being told. They were half ashamed of having taken so much notice of a new girl. Lettuce Talbot turning round caught a glimpse of Honor walking blithely away with a jaunty smile on her face. As if a visit to the headmistress meant nothing at all, she gasped. She'll soon find out her mistake. Replied Ruth Latimer grimly, Miss Cavendish can reduce one to a quaking jelly when she feels inclined. Honor was in one of her wildest, most reckless moods and the prospect of a passage of arms with the principal of the college was as the call of battle to a knight of old. In her conflicts with her governesses at home, she had invariably come off best. 
and it pleased her to think she had now the opportunity of trying her will in opposition to that of the ruler of this little kingdom. Miss Cavendish's study was a beautiful and unusual room. It was built in accordance with an old-world design and in shape resembled an ancient chapter house. The richly carved chimney piece, the dark paneling of the walls, and the straight-backed oak chairs helped to carry out the prevailing note of medievalism, which was further enhanced by a large, stained-glass window filled with figures of saints that faced the doorway. To enter was like going into the peace and serenity of some old cathedral, and, notwithstanding her defiant frame of mind, a feeling of something akin to reverence crept over honor as she crossed the threshold. Her impressionable Celtic temperament could not fail to be influenced by outward surroundings. She had a great love of the beautiful, and this room satisfied her aesthetic tastes. An interview with Miss Cavendish and interview with Miss Cavendish the headmistress was standing beside the hearth, which, though devoid of fire at this season of the year, was piled up with newly cut logs. In her long, clinging black dress, the light from the halo of Saint Aldwith in the window falling on her regular Greek features, and touching with a ruddier gleam the pale gold of her rippling hair, Miss Cavendish looked an imposing and commanding figure, born of a good family. The daughter of a high dignitary of the church, she was by nature a student, and after a brilliant career at Girton she had for a time devoted herself to scientific research. Arousing much interest by her clever articles in various periodicals, but feeling that her true vocation was teaching, she had turned her attention to education, and, gaining a reputation in the scholastic world, had in course of time been elected as the principal of Chessington College, a post which she filled with dignity, and greatly to the satisfaction of both governors and parents. Not a remarkably tender woman, she was perhaps more respected than loved by her pupils. But she had great powers of administration, and managed to impress upon her girls a strict sense of duty and responsibility, a love of work, a fine perception of honor, and a desire to keep up the high tone and prestige of the school. She turned her clear, cold blue eyes on honor as the latter entered the room with a scrutinizing gaze, so comprehensive and so full of authority that, despite her intention of showing a bold front, the girl involuntarily quailed. Come here, Honor Fitzgerald, began Miss Cavendish, in a calm, measured tone. I wish you to explain to me why you have taken it upon yourself to alter the costume which, you are well aware, is obligatory for all attending the college. I can't wear orange, replied Honor, plucking up her courage for the battle. It's against my principles. There are right principles and wrong principles. We will decide presently to which class yours belong. On what grounds do you raise your objection? I'm Irish, said Honor briefly, so I prefer green. That is no reason. We have many nationalities here, and do you imagine that every girl can be permitted to carry out her individual taste? Tell me why you suppose such a rule was framed. I don't know. Returned Honor rebelliously. Then you must think, for I require an answer. Honor stared at the fireplace, at the bookcase, with its richly bound volumes, at the window. Where the red robe of St. Hilary made such a glorious spot of color, at the table, covered with books and papers, and finally her glance went back to the headmistress, whose eyes were still fixed on her with that steady, embarrassing gaze. Was it to make everybody look alike? She replied at last, almost as if the words were dragged from her lips. Exactly. Then, to return to my original question, why, knowing this fact, did you presume to break the rule? 
honor was again silent somehow her intended bravery seemed to desert her i met your father major fitzgerald yesterday continued miss cavendish i understand that he held a command in the royal munster fusiliers and did splendid service in the boer war kindly tell me what explanation he would have given to his general if he had appeared at church parade minus his uniform oh but he wouldn't have done that exclaimed honor in horror why not why because he is a soldier how could he the uniform is part of the service and what is the first duty of a soldier to obey orders answered honor with a spark of apprehension in her eyes you are right now what would happen to a regiment if each individual instead of obeying his superior officer were to follow his own inclinations it would go to pieces and what occurs when a soldier commits any breach of regulations he is court-martialed and punished is that just yes but why oh because because it's the army and they must there couldn't be any discipline without exactly you're an officer's daughter and you evidently appreciate the vast importance of good discipline now we are a little army here every girl as a member of this community is bound to preserve its rules which have been wisely framed and deserve to be faithfully kept you have been guilty of a very grave breach of our regulations and by your own showing you merit punishment do you consider this to be just yes returned honor meeting the headmistress's look firmly we have an esprit de corps at the college continued miss cavendish which makes each girl anxious to keep up the credit and prestige of the school when you have been here a short time and have learnt the tone of the place i believe and trust that you will be truly ashamed of the remembrance of your appearance in chapel this morning it is for this reason i shall not punish you though you have yourself acknowledged that punishment would be only an act of justice as for the matter of principle to which you referred so far from advancing the good fame of your country you were bringing it into disrepute if you imagine it was a particularly patriotic deed to flaunt the shamrock in a wrong place you are much mistaken we have had irish girls here before and i have always been able to rely upon them for the maintenance of our high standard you may go now honor and remove that foolish trimming from your hat and remember that as you have been christened honor i shall expect you to live up to your name honor left the room more subdued than she would have cared to acknowledge the calm well-balanced arguments had completely disarmed her she had entered in a reckless mood almost anxious to be scolded that she might have the chance of showing how little she cared and now for perhaps the first time in her life she had been compelled to think seriously and sensibly upon a subject very few teachers would have taken the trouble to reason thus with a pupil but miss cavendish had her special method of education and believed in paying particular attention to each girl's individuality different plants require different cultivation if you are to obtain good results was one of her axioms you cannot successfully grow roses and carnations with the same treatment she had seen at once partly from her own observation and partly as the result of a talk with major fitzgerald that honor was an unusual and difficult character and she wished to obtain a hold over the girl's mind from the very outset it was part of her system to train her pupils to keep rules rather from a recognition of their justice and value than from a fear of punishment therefore she regarded the ten minutes spent in the study as not wasted time but an opportunity of sowing good seed on hitherto neglected ground vivian holmes was waiting for honor outside the door of the study after conducting her to the school dressing-room 
She produced a pair of scissors and ripped the offending green trimming from the hat in stony silence. May I keep them? Honor ventured to ask, for it went to her heart to see her bunch of cherished shamrock torn ruthlessly from its place and flung aside. As you like, replied Vivian, so long as they are not seen here again. Then, with a look of utterly crushing scorn, she burst out, you needn't think that what you have done is at all clever. It's not the place of a new girl to show off in this way. And you'll gain nothing by it. I am responsible for St. Chad's, and I don't mean to have this kind of nonsense going on there. So please understand, Honor Fitzgerald, that if you give any more trouble, you may expect to find yourself thoroughly well sat upon. Chapter 4 Janie's charged the four-leaved shamrock, having so far belied its reputation, and brought bad luck instead of good upon its wearer. Honor put it away in her drawer, with the resolve not to test its powers again until she was back in her own emerald isle, where, perhaps, it could exercise its magic more freely than in the land of the stranger. Her first day at school was satisfactory, in spite of its bad beginning. She took her place in her new class and made the acquaintance of Miss Farrar, her form mistress, and all the seventeen girls who composed the lower third form. After the quiet and solitude of Kilmore Castle, to be at Chessington College seemed like plunging into the world. It was almost bewildering to meet so many companions, all of whom were busily occupied with employments into which she had not yet been initiated. It was an especially fresh experience for Honor to belong to a class, instead of learning from a private governess, and she much appreciated the change. It interested her to watch the faces of her schoolfellows and to listen to their recitations, or their replies to Miss Farrar's questions. The strict discipline of the place astonished her, the ready answers, the total lack of whispering. The way in which each girl sat straight at her desk, giving her whole attention to the subject in hand, the prompt obedience, even the orderly manner of filing out of the room for lunch. All were as unusual as they were amazing to one who had hitherto behaved as she liked during lessons. She felt for the first time that she was a unit in a large community, and began to have some dim perception of that esprit de corps to which Miss Cavendish had referred during their interview in the study. In spite of her previous laziness and neglect of work, Honor was a very bright girl, and she contrived even in that first morning to satisfy Miss Farrar that she was capable of doing well if she wished. Perhaps, after all, the four-leaved shamrock had sent her a little luck, for she happened to remember a date which the rest of the form had forgotten, and one corresponding credit in consequence. When one o'clock arrived, she arranged her new textbooks and notebooks in the desk that had been allotted to her next to let us Talbot. Did you get into a fearful scrape with Miss Cavendish, Patty? whispered the latter eagerly. Do tell me about it. But Honor pursed up her mouth and looked inscrutable. She was unwilling to divulge what had passed in the study, and Lettuce's curiosity had perforce to go unsatisfied. On her arrival at St. Chad's Honor had been given a spare cubicle in the bedroom occupied by the Talbots and Pauline Reynolds. On the following afternoon, however, Miss Maitland sent for Janie Henderson a girl of nearly sixteen, and informed her that a fresh arrangement had been made. I am going to put you and Honor Fitzgerald together in the room over the porch, she said. I hope that you will get on nicely and become friends. I want you, Janie, to have a good influence over Honor and help her to keep school rules. She does not yet know our St. Chad's standards and has very much to learn. I give her into your charge because I am sure you are conscientious and will try your best to make her wish to improve and turn out a worthy chaddy. 
You may carry your things into your new quarters during recreation time. Yes, Miss Maitland, answered Janie with due respect. She dared not dispute the mistress's orders. But inwardly she was anything but pleased. She did not wish to leave her present cubicle and looked with dismay at the prospect of having to share a bedroom with this wild Irish girl, towards whom as yet she certainly felt no attraction. Janie Henderson had a painfully shy and reserved disposition. Hitherto she had made no friends, invited no confidences, and kept herself to herself at St. Chad's. She was seldom seen walking with a companion, and during recreation generally buried herself in a book, slight, pale, and narrow-chested. Her constitution was not robust, and though a year and a half at Chessington College had already worked a wonderful improvement, she was still far below the ordinary average of good health. She was a quiet, mouse-like girl who seldom obtruded herself or took any prominent part in the life of St. Chad's. A girl who was continually in the background and passed almost unnoticed among her schoolfellows. She had little self-confidence and a sensitive dread of being laughed at. So for this reason she rarely offered a suggestion or an opinion unless invited. She often felt lonely at school, but her shyness prevented her from making advances. And so far nobody had offered her even the elements of friendship. It sometimes hurt her to be thus entirely ignored and left out, but she had grown accustomed to it, and, shutting herself up in her shell, she followed the motto of the Miller of D. I care for nobody. No not I, since nobody cares for me. She was obliged to share in the daily games, which were compulsory for all, but she never joined in the voluntary ones unless she were specially asked to do so, to make up a side, and then she played with an utter lack of enthusiasm. Mooney, as the girls called her, was a bookworm pure and simple, she had read almost every volume in the school library. It did not matter whether it were biography, travels, poetry, essays, or fiction. She would devour any literature that came her way. She lived in an imaginary world, peopled by heroes and heroines of romance, who often seemed more real to her than her schoolmates, and certainly twice as interesting. Half the time she went about in a dream, and even during lesson hours she would let her thoughts drift far away to some exciting incident in a story or some mental picture of her own. It appeared as if Miss Maitland could not have picked out two more opposite and unsuitable girls to share a bedroom than Honor Fitzgerald and Janie Henderson. But she had good reasons for her choice. Not only did she hope that Janie's sober ways would steady Honor, but she also thought that Honor's high spirits would have a leavening effect upon Janie, who was sadly in need of stirring up. I wish I could shake the pear in a bag, she confided to a fellow teacher. It would be of the greatest advantage to both. There was at least one compensation to Janie for being obliged to change her quarters. Number eight. The room over the porch was a special sanctum, much coveted by all the other Chadites. It was arranged to accommodate only two instead of four, and was the beau ideal of every pair of chums. It had a French window opening out onto a tiny balcony, and, having been originally intended for one of the mistresses, was furnished rather more luxuriously than the rest of the bedrooms. There was a handsome wallpaper, a full-length mirror in the wardrobe, a comfortable basket chair, and also what appealed particularly to Janie, a large and inviting bookcase with glass doors. She conducted her removal, therefore, with less dissatisfaction than she had at first anticipated. I call you lucky, declared Lettuce Talbot. 
I only wish I could go instead. Everyone on our landing is envying you. I shall be rather sorry to lose Patty. I think she's a joke. Especially as we're to have Flossie Taylor instead, said Pauline Reynolds. It's a poor exchange. I can't stand Flossie. She gives herself airs. She needn't put them on with us, observed Maisie. I've had a quarrel with her already. She was actually trying to make Lettuce pick up her balls for her at tennis. Lettuce always picks up yours, suggested Pauline. That's a totally different matter, declared Maisie. I wish Miss Maitland would have let Flossie join the Hammondsmith, said Lettuce. I can't imagine why she is making such changes. Oh, here's Honor. Do you know, Patty, you have got notice to quit? In fact, you're going to be evicted from number 13. Honor had already been informed of the fact by the housemistress herself. She appeared to take the news with the utmost sang-froid. I don't care in the least which room I have, she replied. All I bargain for is a roommate who doesn't use cold pig in the mornings. I haven't forgotten your wet sponge. You ungrateful Patty. It was for your good. If you call me Patty, I shall call you Salad. You can if you like. It's rather a pretty name and has a juicy, succulent sound about it. Make haste, honor, and clear your drawers, grunted Maisie. Here's Flossie Taylor coming down the passage with her arms full of underlinen. Number eight, like all other bedrooms at St. Chad's, was divided by a curtain that could be drawn at pleasure. At present, however, this was pulled aside for the mutual convenience of the occupants of both cubicles. To Janie, the burning question to be decided was the possession of the bookcase. She tried to imagine that it was nearer her bed than honors, but justice forced her to come to the conclusion that it stood exactly in the middle, between the two. With heroic self-denial, she offered her companion the first choice of its shelves before she put away her own little library. But I haven't brought any books with me, declared Honor. You're welcome to the bookcase, so far as I'm concerned. We can take turns at this luxury, sinking into the basket chair. Don't you ever read? Very seldom. Janie went on arranging her volumes in silence, the poets on the top shelf, by the side of her edition of Scott's novels, and the miscellaneous authors below. She touched each book tenderly, as though it were an old and dear friend, opening one occasionally to glance at a favorite passage. And she became so absorbed in her occupation that she utterly forgot Honor's presence. There, I've stowed away all my possessions, remarked the latter at last. I don't know whether Miss Maitland judges a room by a tidy bookcase. She said she was coming up presently to see if we had put our things straight. Janie started guiltily. She, who was expected to be the mentor and to keep her companion up to the mark, was certainly the defaulter in this instance. Her bed and the chairs were strewn with various articles, and nothing seemed as yet in its right place. I couldn't help dipping into that book, she confessed. It's a collection of old Irish fairy tales and legends. It was given me yesterday, before I left home, and I've scarcely had time even to look at it. Are they nice? Lovely, to judge by the one I've just sampled. Then do tell it to me. I hate reading. But I'm an absolute baby for loving to be told old tales. I... Oh, I couldn't, exclaimed Janie. Yes, you can, while I'm helping you to put all these things into your drawers. Do, Mavornin. I want to hear the Irish story. When Honor's gray eyes looked pleadingly from under their long, dark lashes and a soft blarney crept into her voice, there were few people who could resist her. Janie flushed pink, she was so seldom asked to do anything for anybody. She had no natural gift for narrative, but she made an effort. There was once an Irishman called Myrta O'Neill, she began, 
and he was walking over London Bridge with a hazel staff in his hand. When an Englishman met him and told him that the stick he carried grew on a spot under which were hidden great treasures, the Englishman was a wizard, and he promised that if Murta would go with him to Ireland and show him the place, he would gain as much gold as he could carry. Murta consented, so they went over to Brompark, in Kerry, where there was a big green mound, and there they dug up the hazel tree on which the staff had grown. Under it they found a broad, flat stone, and this covered the entrance to a cavern where thousands of warriors lay in a circle, sleeping beside their shields, with their swords clasped in their hands. Their arms were so brightly polished that they illuminated the whole cave, and one of them had a shield that outshone the rest, and a crown of gold on his head. In the center of the cave hung a bell, which the wizard told Murta to beware of touching, but if at any time he did so, and one of the warriors were to ask, Is it day? He was to answer without hesitation, No, sleep thou on. The two men took as much as they could carry from a heap of gold pieces that lay amidst the warriors, and Murta managed accidentally to touch the bell. It rang, and one of the warriors immediately asked, Is it day? When Murta answered promptly, No, sleep thou on. The wizard told him that the company he had seen were King Brian Baram and his knights, who lay asleep ready for the dawn of a new day. When the right time should come, the bell would ring loudly, and the warriors would start up and destroy the enemies of Aaron. And once more the descendants of the Tawatha de Danan should rule the island peace. When Murtaugh's treasure was all finished, he went back to the cave and helped himself to more. On his way out he touched the bell, and again it rang, but this time he was not so ready with his answer, and some of the warriors rose up, took the gold from him, beat him, and flung him out of the cave. He never recovered from the beating, but was a cripple to the end of his days. And serve him right, too, declared honor. Brian Varam was a great hero of Ireland. Yes, there's one of Moore's Irish melodies that begins, Remember the glories of Brian the Brave, said Janie. Are there any more stories about him in that book? I'm not sure. But there are tales about fairy wraths and changelings and leprechauns and pokas and banshees and all kinds of extraordinary creatures. Then we'll have one every day, please. I think you're a first-rate storyteller. You're almost as good as old Mary O'Grady. I've often sat by her peat fire and heard about the banshee and the leprechaun, only... She believes in them. I'm so glad I've moved into this bedroom. I like you far better than those girls in number 13. When Miss Maitland came upstairs to inspect number 8, she found Honor and Janie already on a more favorable footing than she had dared to hope, the latter chatting with a vivacity that no one at ST. Chad's had hitherto imagined she possessed. Once she had broken the ice of her shyness, and had broached her beloved topic of books, Janie had plenty to say, and, as Honor was also in a communicative mood, the pair seemed well started on the high road to friendship. It was fortunate for Honor that she had found a congenial roommate, as her first days at Chessington proved rather a time of trial. She was woefully and terribly homesick. It seemed an absolute uprooting to have been torn away from Carrie, and she considered that nothing in her new surroundings could make amends for the change. Her pride upheld her sufficiently to prevent her from showing any outward signs of misery before the inquisitive eyes of her schoolfellows, but every now and then the yearning for Kilmore would rise with an almost unbearable pain, and she would have to fight hard to keep her self-control. Maisie Talbot, she was sure, would regard homesickness as early Victorian and consequently worthy of contempt. 
and she was determined not to give either Maisie or any of the others an opportunity of laughing at her. She felt very keenly the confinement and restraint of school life. To be obliged to study lessons and play games at specified hours, all within a certain limited area, seemed an utter contrast to the freedom in which she had hitherto reveled. And she would long for a scamper with Butte and Barney, her two terriers, or a sail with her father down the creek and out into the Atlantic. She would pour enthusiastic descriptions of her home into Janie's ears, until the latter felt she knew Kilmore Castle and its domain and the little fishing village, with its peat smoke and its warm-hearted peasants, and the rocks and the moors and the stream, and the green, treacherous bogs, almost as well as Honor herself. Notwithstanding her former reputation for unsociability, Janie, at the end of three days, had completely lost her heart to this wayward, impulsive daughter of Erin. It was true. Honor was apt to be trying at times. Her gusts of hot temper, petulance, or utter unreasonableness were rather disconcerting to anyone unaccustomed to the Celtic disposition. But they never lasted long, and Janie soon found out that her friend rarely meant what she then said, and was generally particularly lovable after an outburst. With a winsome look on her face and a beguiling, endearing tone in her voice that would have gained forgiveness from a stone, with the rest of the members of ST. Chad's honor was also on good terms. She could be very amusing and full of racy Irish humor when she liked, and would send the girls into fits of laughter with her quaint sayings and funny stories. Her nickname of Patty Pepperbox stuck to her, and she certainly justified it occasionally. She's like a volcano, declared Lettuce Talbot. Sometimes if you tease her, she starts with a bang and lets off steam for five minutes. Then it's all over, and she's quite pleasant again. Until next time. I'd rather have that than sulking at any rate, said Dorothy Arkwright. A storm often clears the air. It's not much use chaffing her either, said Madge Summers, for she always seems to get the best of it. Yes, if she's down one minute, she'll bob up again the next like a cork. Honor's humors were apt to overflow into the region of practical jokes. These were generally played on such genial recipients as Lettuce Talbot and Madge Summers, but occasionally she would venture on more dangerous ground. One afternoon, at the end of her first week at Chessington, she was in the dressing room, changing her shoes in preparation for cricket, when Ruth Latimer interposed. I forgot to tell you, Patty. Games are off today. Why? asked Honor in astonishment, for the hour and a half in the playing fields was as strict a part of the college curriculum as the morning lessons. Because it's the health testing. What's that? A kind of medical examination, explained Dorothy Arkwright. We always have it at the beginning of each term, to make sure that. As Miss Cavendish expresses it, we are physically fit for the duties of school life. Oh, said Honor, looking rather aghast at the prospect. You needn't pull such a long face, Patty, said Lettuce. We none of us mind. Indeed, we think it's a joke. We have a lady doctor, you see, said Ruth, and she's so jolly. She keeps one laughing all the time. What does she do? Oh, weighs us and sounds our lungs, and tests our eyes, and measures our chests. You'll have to draw a deep breath, and to put out your tongue, and to let her look at your teeth, added lettuce. And if any girl is really very much below standard, said Dorothy, she is turned out to grass. That means that she only does half lessons. Of course, she has to be rather bad for that. Remarked Ruth. It's never been my luck yet lamented Lettuce. I should think not, with those fat, red cheeks. 
you couldn't look delicate however hard you tried it happened to janey henderson though in her first term how little did you weigh mooney i'm sure i forget returned janey who had joined the group but you had to be fed up on cream and beaten eggs and all kinds of things i remember how we envied you are you weighed in stones or pounds here asked donner in stones it's very puzzling to some of the colonials because they're accustomed to american machines that register in pounds they have to do a sum before they can calculate the result when does this exam come off sometime this afternoon we go up in relays it's st chad's turn today on wednesday it was the schoolhouse and on thursday st aldwitha's then on saturday it will be st hilary's and st bride's it takes nearly a week to get through the whole school the medical examination was to be conducted at the sanatorium and dr mary forbes was already installed there and busily employed when honor and her classmates arrived she begins with monitresses and then works downwards explained dorothy i don't expect it will be our turn for half an hour yet but we're obliged to stay here to be ready in case we're called it's not nearly so alarming as the dentist said ruth the waiting room was full of girls who were beguiling the time with jokes and banter and lively chatter lettuce ruth and dorothy soon mingled in the crowd and forgot all about their irish companion until the voice of vivian holmes was heard announcing next ruth latimer chatty burns madge summers and honor fitzgerald where's honor asked lettuce she was here just now why she's there actually outside in the garden replied dorothy what's she doing dodging about the rockery someone call her quick honor came running in looking rather flushed and hot and with a curious bulgy appearance about her blouse where have you been demanded ruth but her question went unanswered for vivian whisked the four girls with scant ceremony into dr mary forbes's consulting room time was too precious to be wasted and the monitress was something of a disciplinarian honor sat watching with deep interest while first ruth then chatty and finally madge were duly examined and passed as sound she was called then and after her name and age had been entered on her chart and her height taken she was told to step onto the weighing machine round swung the pointer and stopped at eight stone four pounds dr mary looked at the dial almost incredulously she thought there must be something wrong with the machine stand off for a minute she said while i examine the weights i must have made a mistake honor obeyed with a very solemn face she appeared to be taking the matter with unusual seriousness dr mary readjusted the lever and even oiled the machine but when honor stepped onto it again it registered exactly the same it's most extraordinary exclaimed the lady doctor for a girl of your height and slight build i have never known such a record and she gazed at honor's rather slender proportions in amazement i expect its bones volunteered honor the fitzgeralds are a big-boned family your bones would have to be of cast iron to bring you up to eight stone odd cried dr mary the machine must be at fault it's absurd on the face of it a small slim girl like you perhaps it's the change of air since i arrived said honor innocently but at the same time she looked at madge summers with a very mischievous expression on her face she's up to something thought madge and nudged ruth though she dared not venture to whisper of course we eat a great deal over in ireland continued honor there is nothing like potatoes for making one grow i saw in the british almanac that they were twice as nourishing as anything except herrings and oatmeal and we have those too in kerry 
I think, in that case, we must try banting, said D.R. Mary, who must have caught Honor's glance, for she suddenly took hold of her and began feeling her carefully. Ah, uh, she exclaimed, so these are the extra bones, are they? And diving into her patient's pocket, she drew out stone after stone, and as many more again that had been tucked down in the front of the white flannel blouse. The doctor was a good-tempered woman with a strong sense of humor, and, instead of scolding, she laughed heartily at having been taken in by such a trick. I've had patients who shandle before, she declared, but never such a scandalous case of imposition as this. Well, the girls told me the weight was to be reckoned by stones, said Honor. With a twinkle in her eye, so I thought I'd better come well provided. I'm not at all sorry to be rid of them if they're not wanted. Get onto that machine again immediately, commanded Dr. Mary, with an effort to be severe. Ah, six stone five pounds is rather a difference. It's lucky for you I didn't put you on starvation diet to reduce you. Don't try to be so clever again, or I shall have to perform an operation to get rid of your cheek. Madge, Ruth, and Chatty had sat chuckling with subdued delight during the interview, and the moment they were out of the room they published the story abroad for the edification of the others. She thinks of such funny things, laughed Madge. Things that nobody else would ever dream of doing. I was afraid she'd get into a fearful scrape, confessed Chatty. Oh, Dr. Mary Forbes is too jolly to mind, said Ruth. She was far more amused than cross. If it had been Miss Maitland or Miss Cavendish, now. But I should imagine that even Honor Fitzgerald would scarcely dare to play a practical joke upon either of them. Chapter 5 A Writing Lesson The College Had Reopened on a Tuesday So that by her first Sunday Honor had been at school five days. In her own estimation it seemed more like five months, but as she had left home on April 24th, and the Shakespeare calendar in the recreation room, a leaf of which was torn off punctually each morning by the monitress, only recorded April 29th. She was obliged reluctantly to acknowledge the evidence of the almanac, and realized that twelve whole weeks must intervene before the joyful termination of what she considered her banishment from Aaron. Sundays were made very pleasant at Chessington. In the morning the girls attended the parish church at Dunscar. In the afternoon they might read, or stroll about the grounds where they pleased, an indulgence not permitted on weekdays. During the summer term they were allowed to carry their four o'clock tea into the garden. All was laid ready by the servants in the dining hall, and each girl might pour out her own cup, and, taking what bread and butter she wished, retire with a few select companions to some nook under the trees or a seat in an ivy-covered arbor. From half-past four to half-past five was silence hour, which everyone was required to devote to reading from a special library of books carefully chosen for the purpose by Miss Cavendish. I won't call them Sunday books, she sometimes said, because I consider our religion would be a very poor thing if it were only kept for one day in the week. What we learn in this quiet time we must apply in our busy hours and let the helpful words we read influence our ordinary life and go towards the building of character, which is the most invaluable of all possessions. At half-past six there was a short service in chapel, and the rest of the evening, after supper, was given up to the writing of home letters. All the routine of the school was still new to honor, and she felt very strange and unusual as, precisely at ten o'clock, she took her place among the lines of Chessingtonians marshaled in the quadrangle preparatory to setting off for church. Miss Cavendish gave the signal to start, and the two hundred girls filed along two and two, 
all dressed alike in white serge coats and skirts and best sailor hats with their house colors the blue ribbons of the schoolhouse leading the way followed by the pink of st aldwitha's and the orange violet and scarlet of st chad's st bride's and st hilary's respectively i believe it's considered one of the sights of the neighborhood to see us parade through the lichgate said lettuce talbot who happened to be walking with honor visitors stand in the churchyard and try to count us they make the most absurd remarks sometimes i suppose they think we shan't overhear what they say really they seem to look upon us as a kind of show and i quite expect we shall be put down in the next edition of the guidebook as one of the attractions of dunscar of course we take no notice we walk along with our noses in the air as if we weren't aware that anyone was even thinking of us but all the same we feel giggles inside when we catch a whisper they look like angels dressed in white or what a pile of washing they must make honor had been looking forward immensely to this sunday morning for she hoped she might have an opportunity of seeing her brother dermot who was at dr winterton's school dermot was her favorite among her five brothers and the thought that orley grange and chessington stood only a mile and a half apart had so far been her one thread of comfort to catch even a distant glimpse of dermot would be like a peep at home and she felt that a moment's talk with him would be sufficient to send her back to St. Chad's rejoicing. The students of the college occupied the whole of the left aisle of the church, and the right aisle was reserved for Dr. Winterton's pupils. As a rule, the girls arrived early and took their seats first, and they always passed out by a side door, so that they seldom met the boys in the churchyard should they happen to do so however it was etiquette to take no notice of them even though some might be relations or intimate friends honor was unaware of this rule which her classmates not knowing she had a brother at the grange had not thought of mentioning to her on this particular sunday either miss cavendish or dr winterton had slightly miscalculated the time for the two schools arrived at exactly the same minute as there was not room for all to march in together through the lich gate the boys were drawn up like a regiment and waited for the college to go by the girls sailed past with well-bred unconsciousness their eyes fixed discreetly upon the prayer books and hymn books that they carried all except poor impulsive unconventional honor who made a sudden dart out of the line and snatched rapturously at a brown-faced curly-headed boy by his coat sleeve dermot dermot i am glad to see you she exclaimed in a voice that could be heard from end to end of the ranks oh i say honor stow it murmured the boy in an agonized tone turning as red as fire and trying to back away from her naturally honor's unexpected and unprecedented act caused a great sensation lettuce talbot stopped when deserted by her partner and the girls behind her were obliged to halt too all wondered what had happened and in spite of their excellent training and good discipline their curiosity got the better of them and they craned their necks to look miss farrar saved the situation by hurrying to honor seizing her by the shoulder and forcing her back into her place then the long line once more moved forward and the chessingtonians slightly ruffled but trying to carry off the affair in a dignified fashion marched with admirable coolness into the church if honor had a little surreptitious cry behind her prayer book she managed to conceal the fact from the neighbors on either side of her in the pew and if her eyes looked suspiciously red and there was a slight tendency to chokiness in her voice as she walked home after service lettuce talbot at any rate was tactful enough to take no notice 
though she seized the opportunity of explaining the school code of decorum and was severe in her censure you ought to have told me before said honor how could i know that i mustn't speak to my own brother i didn't even know you had a brother returned lettuce and i never dreamt you'd do such an idiotic thing as rush at him like that he evidently didn't appreciate it no i thought he'd be more glad to see me gulped honor not the least part of whose trouble had been dermot's cold reception of her enthusiastic greeting how silly you are does any boy care to parade his sister before his whole school i expect he'll get tremendously chuffed about this poor fellow really patty you ought to know better considerably chastened by lettuce's crushing remarks honor subsided into silence and only reopened the subject when in company with janey henderson she had retired after dinner to a spot overlooking the playing fields it was a warm beautiful afternoon a day when you could almost hear the buds bursting and the flowers opening the two girls spread their jerseys on the grass and sat basking in the sunshine watching a lark soar up into the blue overhead or the seagulls flapping leisurely round the cliffs or listening to the caw of the jackdaws that in company with a flock of starlings were feeding in a neighboring ploughed field the sea lay a sparkling sheet of pearly gray and honor looked wistfully at its broad expanse when she remembered that its farther waves washed the rocky shores of ireland janey was the only girl at s t chads to whom she cared to mention her home with the others she could exchange jokes but not confidences and though she returned their banter with interest she did not look to them for sympathy janey seemed altogether different from the rest she never laughed at honor and even if she remonstrated it was in such a gentle apologetic way that the most touchy of celtic natures could not have taken offence miss maitland had not overlooked the episode of the morning she had had a few words to say after their return from church and honor in consequence was feeling rather sore and ready to pour out her grievances into her friend's ears it's too bad she declared if you can't speak to your own brother to whom may you speak i should like to know it seems absurd that dermot should be living at the grange not two miles off and yet we're never to see one another i thought i should at least meet him once a week and now i mayn't even say how do you do without being scolded as if i had committed a highway robbery is he your favorite brother asked janey yes he's the nearest in age to me and we're great chums we have the wildest fun during the holidays we dare each other to do the maddest things we can think of what kind of things well one day when old biddy mccarthy was ill with quinzy we got up early and took her cart to Bolikrigan Market, and Dermot sold all her chickens for her. He talked away like a cheap jack and made such fun, people nearly died with laughing. You see, most of them knew who he was, and it seemed so absurd to hear him proclaiming the virtues of Biddy's fowls. Then we filled the cart with seed potatoes as a present for her and tore home so fast that the traces broke and the donkey ran straight out of the shafts we fell on the road nearly buried in potatoes but luckily we weren't hurt we managed to catch the donkey and to mend the traces with a piece of string then we had to put all the potatoes back biddy laughed so much when we told her about the adventure that it cured her quinsy and she said she never had such a splendid crop of potatoes as from those we brought her that day from Bolikrigan. That was Dermot's joke, but I think mine was quite as much fun. What was yours? I saved up my pocket money to get a little pig to give to old Mickey the cobbler. Dermot and I walked over to Ennisfellan Fair to buy it and drove it home with a string tied to its leg as fast as we pulled one way it ran another 
And just as we got to Mickey's cabin, the string snapped, and off the pig bolted down the village and ran straight into the open door of the school. The children chased it round and round beneath the forms and caught it at last under the master's desk. Oh, we have lively times at Kilmore. Then once Dermot and I ran away and went to see Cousin Teresa at Sleeve Donnell. Nobody knew where we were for two days, and people were hunting all over the country for us. They thought we must have been drowned or have fallen into the bog. But weren't your father and mother fearfully anxious? asked Janie, who had listened almost aghast to the recital of those wild escapades. Well, father was rather cross about that, certainly. He was never really very angry, though, until the last time. When I, but here honor stopped. On the whole, she decided she would not relate the story of Firefly. She could not quite understand the expression on Janie's face, and she began to doubt whether her friend would altogether sympathize with her. Instead, she plunged into a detailed description of her elder brothers, telling how two were preparing for the army at Sandhurst, how another was at Oxford, and the fourth was studying law. I suppose you are nearly always with your mother. As you are the only girl, said Janie. Well, no, admitted Honor. She's so delicate and so often ill. I'm afraid I give her a headache. My mother is delicate too, confided Janie. She has most dreadful neuralgia sometimes. I bathe her head with eau de cologne, mixed with very hot water, and it always does her good. She calls me her little nurse. Have you ever tried hot water with eau de cologne for your mother's headaches? Honor had never dreamt of offering any help or assistance to anyone in sickness. The idea was quite new to her, and that Janie evidently expected her to be her mother's companion and right hand surprised her. She had already met with many astonishments at St. Chad's, where most of the views of life seemed different from her old standards. She scarcely liked to confess that she was of so little use at home, and hastily turned the conversation back to her brother Dermot. Do you think if I were to ask Miss Cavendish, she would let him call to see me? She suggested. Janie shook her head. I'm quite sure she wouldn't, she replied. The rules are so strict about visitors. Nobody but our parents is allowed, except an occasional uncle or aunt, never a brother. You'd better not suggest it. Then I shall have to go and see him. How could you, Honor? Don't be so unreasonable. I thought I might find an opportunity some day, said Honor reflectively. One never knows what may turn up. Dear old Dermot, it would be hard luck to be within two miles of him for a whole term without exchanging a single word. Well, if you do, you'll get into a far bigger scrape than you'll like. You'd much better wait until the holidays when you'll probably both travel home together, advised Janie. There certainly were no opportunities at Chessington College for paying calls. Except on half-holidays, the girls seldom went beyond the school grounds, the large playing fields providing a wide enough area for exercise. The members of the fifth and sixth forms were allowed to go out occasionally within specified bounds. If they went three together, but the younger ones had not attained to such a privilege. We mayn't even put our noses through the gate of the quad, said Lettuce Talbot. In reply to a question from Honor, who chafed sorely against the rule, not unless we can get a special exit from Miss Cavendish, and that's only given once in a blue moon. It's no use looking volcanic, Patty. You'll have to grin and bear it. It's as bad as being in prison, grumbled Honor. Nonsense, snapped Maisie Talbot. You have cricket or tennis for nearly two hours every afternoon. What more can you want? I'd rather play games myself than do anything else. 
You can't expect to do just as you like at school, remarked Dorothy Arkwright, who sometimes joined with Maisie in squashing honor. The writing lessons begin next Thursday, said Lettuce, with an attempt at consolation. They are very jolly. Mr. Townsend always takes the class a trot over the tour. You said you were to learn writing. It's the one lesson I begged for, replied Honor. I could have dispensed with Latin or German or mathematics. Maisie and I are to begin this term. We're looking forward to it tremendously. You are lucky, said Pauline Reynolds enviously. I'd give all I possess to be going with you. I've never ridden anything more interesting than a rocking horse or a donkey on the sands, and one doesn't get much of a canter for sixpence. I believe I'm horribly nervous, and I don't mind confessing it, declared Lettuce. The idea of being perched on a great, tall horse makes me shake in my shoes. When it begins to trot, I shall drop off. I know I shall. Don't be so silly, protested Maisie. You can stick on to Teddy at home all right. Honor Fitzgerald, can you ride? Bear back if you like, said Honor. Dermot and I used to take our old pony and practice what we called circus performances. Pixie quite entered into the spirit of the thing and would walk along gently while we stood on his back. I hear Mr. Townsend brings very fresh horses, said Lettuce, with a shiver of apprehension. I do hope he'll choose me a quiet one. The fresher the better for me, said Honor. I'm just longing for a good gallop. But suppose it runs away, then it will have to take me with it. If it's any kind of a beast with four legs, I'll undertake to make it fly. I heard that Mr. Townsend's horses aren't worth the fag of riding, observed Flossie Taylor, who had joined the group. There speaks the voice of envy. You wouldn't say so if you were taking the lessons, retorted Maisie. People who are accustomed to hunt at home don't care about hired hacks, drawled Flossie, in her most supercilious manner. It all depends on the sort of hunting, returned Honor, who is never at a loss. If it's only hunt the slipper, I'll admit it's not much of a training. And you might be afraid of your seat. The riding course was a special feature of the summer term at Chessington. It was an extra, not part of the ordinary school curriculum. As were the games. A master came from Dunscar and would escort select little parties of girls for a trot upon the tour, a stretch of moorland not far from the college. Mr. Townsend did not care to take out many pupils at once, so on the following Thursday afternoon only seven horses were waiting in the quadrangle. The Talbots, Ruth Latimer, and Honor represented St. Chad's, while two girls from St. Hilary's and one from St. Bride's completed the party. Let us confess to a very superior and elated feeling as the reins were laid in her hand and the cavalcade began to move, particularly as Flossie Taylor and the Hammondsmiths were just setting off for tennis and could not help witnessing the start, though they resolutely looked the opposite way. Flossie always tries to be extremely grand herself and make other people seem small, whispered Lettuce. Fortunately, one needn't take people at their own estimate, replied Maisie, whose downright nature much disliked Flossie's habit of bragging. To all the seven girls it was a delight to find themselves passing under the archway of the big gate and away along the road towards the tour. A chestnut called Victor had fallen to Honor's share, and though he was very tall in comparison with her old favorite Pixie, she nevertheless sat him well. She looks just like the picture of Diana Vernon in our Rob Roy, remarked Lettuce to Maisie, gazing with admiration at the upright, graceful figure of her schoolmate, who seemed perfectly at home in the saddle. Lettuce was getting on much better than her modest protestations beforehand would have led her friends to expect. Violet Wright, 
the girl from St. Bride's, was quite a beginner and mister. Townsend held her horse by a leading rein, while Gwen Roby, from St. Hilary's, looked rather solemn, as if she were not altogether sure that she was enjoying the experience. I've ridden before, she explained, but only on a small pony, and this feels so very different. At first the party went at a walking pace, but on coming to a good, level stretch of road the master gave the order to trot, and his pupils were able to test the capacities of their steeds. Honor, at least, was most unwilling to pull up when Mr. Townsend called out, Halt! I am afraid she did not want a lesson, only a scamper through the fresh air. And she listened impatiently while the master explained the right position of the whip, the hold on the snaffle, and the principle of rising elegantly in the saddle. It's all very well to talk of principles, said Per Violet, who happened to find herself next to Lettuce. I expect a little practice will be of more use to me. At present I jog up and down like a sack of flour, and it's all I can manage to stick on anyhow. I know I shall be as stiff as a board tomorrow. When we reach the tour we may manage a short canter, said Mr. Townsend, but for the present I wish you to keep together. Now then, young ladies, please, elbows in and heads up. Hold the reins rather short in the hand, and take care not to bear on the curb. It's no fun, is it? remarked Honor as she passed Ruth Latimer. Are we only going to walk in a stupid row and then trot for about ten yards? I thought we should be flying along like a hunt. I'd rather be on Pixie at home. I could always make him go when I tickled his ears. If we don't hurry up a little more, I shall try it on this horse and see if he won't break into something more interesting than a snail's pace. Oh, Honor, do take care, remonstrated prudent Ruth. But Honor did not stop to listen, and pushed on ahead of the others, swishing her whip about in a manner that drew instant reproof from the master. They had left the highway, and were now on a road leading across the open moor. On one side the cliffs descended steeply to the sea, and on the other rose bare, rolling hills, covered with short, fine grass. The sails of a windmill or an occasional storm-swept tree alone breaking the line of the horizon. It was a very suitable place for a canter, and after a few preliminary remarks, Mr. Townsend started his flock on what seemed to most of them a rather mad career, following closely himself in their wake, to continue his instructions, courage, Miss Roby, Miss Talbot, you are leaning over in your saddle, Miss Lettuce, your elbows again, Miss Wright, you must learn not to grasp the pommel, don't drag the rein, Miss Latimer, keep a light hand, what, tired already, well, I won't work you too hard just at first. A little shaken and agitated by the unwanted exercise, the girls checked their horses to a walk. They were none of them practiced riders, and all were glad that no more was expected from them for the present. Honor, however, was some way on in front, and, instead of pulling up, as she was told, she gave her horse a switch across the flank and a tweak on the ear, such as she had been accustomed to bestow on her old pony at home. The effect was magical. Seaside hacks are not generally prone to run away, but this one had a little spirit left in him. He resented his rider's liberties, and, feeling the soft grass under his feet, fled as if he were on a race course. Miss Fitzgerald, Miss Fitzgerald, shouted Mr. Townsend, but he might as well have spoken to the wind. Honor had found her opportunity and was quick to seize it. Instead of attempting to pull up Victor, she let him have his head. She had no desire to check his pace, the motion was so exhilarating. 
and she could not resist the temptation to display her horsemanship before the rest of the class the unfortunate master dared not desert his other nervous and inexperienced pupils to give chase and in a few minutes she had left the remainder of the party a mile behind they could see her tearing past the coast guard station where an old man with a telescope yelled wildly to her to stop past a windmill where children and chickens scrambled in hot haste out of her path and away over the moor until she quite disappeared from sight the girls were in a panic of alarm mr townsend turned rather white but preserved his presence of mind and leading his little company straight to the coast guard station made all dismount and tied up the horses then he set out himself in pursuit of the runaway honor meanwhile continued her john gilpin gallop on and on she flew her hair as the fairy tales say whistling in the wind it occurred to her at last that she might be going too far and she made an effort to pull up but it was of no avail victor had got the bit firmly between his teeth and nothing could hold him luckily the girl did not lose her nerve but waited until she could tire him out and get him in hand again and i verily believe she would have succeeded in mastering him and turning him safely on his homeward course had not the way been unexpectedly barred by a fence the poor old horse must have been a hunter during some period of his life he went at the fence like a greyhound and cleared it nimbly but there were a trench and a rough bank on the farther side and as he alighted he stumbled flinging honor violently from the saddle mercifully her foot came clear of the stirrup and she rolled safely into a bed of nettles while victor scrambling up again made off without her over the crest of the hill honor picked herself out of the nettles as quickly as she could no bones were broken and except for some painful stings she was none the worse for her adventure nevertheless the situation was awkward there she was on the open moor many miles away from chessington and obliged to make her way home to s t chad's as best she could she climbed over the fence and holding up her habit set out to walk back in the direction in which she had come it seemed slow progress compared with riding and she began to wonder how long it would take her to retrace her steps she had not gone more than half a mile however when she met mr townsend who had at last succeeded in reaching her his relief at finding her alive and unhurt was almost too great for words he put her quietly on his own horse and led it by the bridle back to the coast guard station where the rest of the girls were waiting very anxious to know what had become of honor and very rejoiced when they saw she was safe there was no further riding lesson that day as Maisie talbot explained afterwards to a select company of interested friends i'm sure mr townsend was frightfully angry but he scarcely said a word he only took us straight home at once in a kind of solemn procession he had to walk himself leading honors and violet's horses so of course we went horribly slowly and he looked so savage that nobody dared to speak what possessed you patty asked lettuce i had an idea of going to see dermot confessed honor i thought if i rode straight up to the grange and asked leave from dr winterton perhaps he'd let us have half an hour together well you are the silliest goose why the grange is in exactly the opposite direction will you never learn sense and lettuce collapsed with laughter mr townsend is having a long talk with miss maitland at this present moment announced ruth latimer then i'm glad i'm not you patty chuckled lettuce nobody ever knew the details of mr townsend's interview with the housemistress or what explanation he gave of the affair 
though he was perfectly persuaded that it was Honor's own fault. It was difficult for him to blame her for what might, after all, have been a mere accident. So, beyond a few words of warning about the danger of whipping her horse without proper orders, she did not on this occasion receive the scolding that she certainly merited. Victor was found on the hills six miles away from Chessington, gently cropping the grass, and allowed himself to be caught by a passing farmer. He was not used at the riding lessons again. Honor was in future given the tamest and least spirited of the mounts, and for the next two lessons was even kept strictly to the leading rein. She's fearfully disgusted about it, said Lettuce, and it certainly is a humiliation when she can ride so well. It's quite the worst punishment Mr. Townsend could possibly have given her, and I expect he knows it. Chapter 6 The Lower Third The Lower Third Form at Chessington College numbered 17 pupils, eight of whom were members of St. Chad's. In addition to honor, these included Maisie and Lettuce Talbot, Ruth Latimer, Pauline Reynolds, Janie Henderson, Effie Lawson, and Flossie Taylor. The teacher, Miss Farrar, was rather a favorite with her class. Though she could well uphold her authority and maintain the good discipline that was universal in the school, she was not so strict as some of the other mistresses. She had a very pleasant, genial manner. She was a capital tennis player and no mean figure at hockey and cricket. She was a prominent supporter of the debating society and the Natural History Union, and was altogether so cheerful and brisk that jolly was the word generally applied to her. Honor liked Miss Farrar, and, according to her lights, really made a heroic effort in the direction of good behavior. Her conduct was certainly immeasurably superior to what it had been with her governesses at home, and yet, judged by Chessington's standards, it was frequently irregular and unorthodox. With her best endeavors, she could not grasp the fact that education is a very solemn affair, and a schoolroom about the last place in the world where one should try to be funny. She never seemed able to be absolutely serious, and at the least opportunity her Celtic humor would flash out and not only upset the gravity of the class, but sometimes even cause Miss Farrar to have a difficulty in keeping her countenance. She was a slightly disturbing element in the form. When it was her turn to answer, there would be an air of general expectancy in the room. The didactic language of the textbooks was often paraphrased by her lips into something of a more racy description. And even her mistakes were as delicious as her quaint methods of stating facts. Miss Farrar occasionally suspected her of intentionally giving wrong replies for the sheer satisfaction of causing amusement, but it was difficult to prove the charge, since, however ludicrous her statements might be, she never under any circumstances laughed at them herself, and all the while her large, gray Irish eyes would be fixed upon her teacher with the innocence of a baby. Thanks to Janie Henderson's assiduity, Honor conformed tolerably well to the ordinary rules. Mindful of Miss Maitland's charge, Janie considered herself responsible for Honor, and was continually ready to jog her memory about what exercises must be written, what lessons learned, and what books brought to class, all of which were details that her friend would not have troubled about on her own account, but in spite of her exertions, the poor girl often saw her protege in trouble. The worst of it is, she admitted to herself that one never knows what to expect. Honor is a darling, but she does such peculiar and extraordinary things, she almost takes one's breath away. If I could be prepared for them beforehand and warn her, it might be of some use, but I can't, so she's bound to get into scrapes. Undoubtedly. 
Very unprecedented happenings took place in the lower third, happenings such as had never occurred before Honor's advent. Who but she would have thought of tilting two books together and emptying the ink pot on the top of them when asked to describe a watershed? Yet she looked genuinely astonished when the vials of Miss Farrar's wrath descended upon her, and said almost reproachfully that she was only trying to give a practical illustration. One day she smuggled Pete, the kitten from St. Chad's, into class and shut him inside her desk, where he settled down quite comfortably and slept peacefully through the French lesson. But in the middle of algebra, Honor, who hated mathematics, managed to give him a surreptitious pinch, with the result that a long-drawn, impatient, objecting meow suddenly resounded through the room. Miss Farrar gave quite a jump, and looked round, but could see nothing. Honor sat bolt upright, with arms folded and eyes fixed attentively on the blackboard, as if she were sublimely unconscious of any noise in her vicinity. What can it be? It sounds like a cat, said Miss Farrar, peering about on the floor, and even peeping into the cupboard where the chalk and the new books were kept. The girls jumped up and pretended to look under their desks. Most of them had an inkling of the situation, but they were human enough to enjoy an interruption in the midst of difficult equations. Perhaps it's a mouse in the wainscot that's not feeling quite well this morning, suggested Honor, though it would have needed an absolute giant of a mouse to give vent to the unearthly yowl in which Pete had indulged. She said it, however, rather too innocently on this occasion. Miss Farrar was not dull, and had suspected from the beginning who was at the bottom of the mischief, indeed. It was easy enough by this time to trace the noise to the right spot, for the kitten had begun to scratch and lifted up its voice in a series of emphatic wails, evidently protesting vigorously against solitary confinement. Miss Farrar walked straight to Honor's desk and opened it when out jumped Pete, purring with satisfaction, and arching his back as if in expectation of petting. The teacher seized him by the scruff of the neck and gave him to Janie Henderson, at the same time quelling the unseemly mirth of her class with a withering glance. The liberation of Pete, the liberation of Pete, carry this kitten back at once to St. Chad's, she commanded. Honor Fitzgerald, you will learn two pages of Greek chronology and repeat them to me before school tomorrow morning. Let us tell it. Take a forfeit. Girls, I am astonished at you. Open your books instantly, every one of you. Gwen Roby, read out your answer to example 37. Though Honor was popular with most of the members of her form, she was never on very good terms with Flossie Taylor. Flossie had a sharp tongue and liked to make sarcastic remarks, and though Honor would promptly return the compliment and often squash the other completely, continual bickering did not promote harmony between the pair. Flossie was occasionally capable of certain dishonorable acts, which always drew upon her honor's utmost indignation and scorn. The latter could not tolerate cheating or copying and spoke her mind freely on the subject. Well, I'm sure I'm not nearly as bad as you. Flossie retorted once, You do the most outrageous things. I never mix the French and history exercises, nor dip the chalk into the red ink. It's worse to crib someone else's work, protested Honor, because that's sneaky and underhand. What would Miss Farrar say if she knew you wrote dates on a slip of paper and put it inside your dictionary? and then copied them when you pretended you were only looking how to spell a word. Miss Farrar won't find out, and what the eye doesn't see the heart doesn't grieve for. But it's so mean. You turning mentor, sneered Flossie. Really? I wonder what we may expect next. Come, girls, 
And here, most righteous and well-conducted Patty preach a homily on how to be the pattern pupil. Patty is quite right, declared Maisie Talbot, taking up the cudgels for once on honor's behalf. There's a difference between her way of breaking rules and yours. She mayn't be exactly a shining example to the class, but at any rate, she's always square and above board, and that's more than I can say for you. We're none of you as saints, added lettuce, but we've never gone in for cribbing at Chessington. No other girl in the form ever does it. It was not only as regards the question of fairness in her work that Flossie failed to reach the standard of honor current in the lower third. She had many little meannesses, so small in themselves as to be hardly worthy of notice, yet enough in the aggregate to exhibit her character unfavorably. One morning, just as the girls were going to their desks, Maisie Talbot suddenly remembered that it was Miss Farrar's birthday. We ought to say something about it, she whispered to Lettuce. I wish we had thought of it before and bought her some flowers. How stupid we were to forget. Are you sure it's her birthday? How do you know? asked Flossie, who was standing near. And overheard. I'm absolutely certain. I have her name in my birthday book, replied Maisie. Flossie said no more just then. But the moment Miss Farrar came into the room, she stood up and wished her many happy returns in the name of the whole form, before either Maisie or Lettuce had the opportunity to say a word. They were most annoyed to be thus forestalled. It was our idea, protested Lettuce afterwards. You didn't even know it was Miss Farrar's birthday before we mentioned it. And yet you calmly took all the credit and made yourself the mouthpiece of the class, exclaimed the equally indignant Maisie. I suppose I had as good a right as anybody else to offer congratulations, laughed Flossie. You should have brought yours out a little quicker. Flossie might be appreciated by her cousins, the Hammond Smiths, and their particular friends, the Lawsons and the Palmers, but she was certainly not a favorite in her own form. Nearly everybody had a squabble with her upon some pretext. Even Janie Henderson, whose retiring disposition involved her in few disputes with her schoolfellows, found a cause for complaint. It was one of the ordinary regulations that the girls should each take the office of warden for a week in turn, the duties being to give out any necessary books, clean the blackboard, distribute fresh pens and blotting paper and collect any articles that might be left in the room after lesson hours. By general custom, all pencils, India rubbers, or other stray possessions were put into what was known as the forfeit tray, whence their owners might reclaim them by paying the penalty of the loss of an order mark. Each girl had her pencil box, in which she was expected to keep her own property, but many things were usually left lying about, and the warden always made a careful search at one o'clock. The most cherished object in Janie's desk was a little, pearl-handled penknife, which she greatly valued. She guarded it zealously, lending it as seldom as she could, and taking good care that it was always returned to her immediately. One unfortunate day, however, she had been sharpening her pencil at the close of the arithmetic lesson, and in the preoccupation of correcting her answers, she laid her treasure down and forgot all about it. She remembered it after dinner and ran back to the schoolroom to rescue it. But it was nowhere to be found. It must have been put in the forfeit tray, she said to herself. I shall get it tomorrow, though it will cost me an order mark, worse luck. She looked eagerly next morning when Miss Farrar produced the tray, but her penknife was not among the lost property. She made a few inquiries in the class, but nobody professed to have seen it, and she was obliged to abandon it as hopelessly gone. It must have been quite a week after this that one evening when the ST. Chad's girls were sitting in the recreation room, 
Flossie pulled her handkerchief from her pocket and in so doing whisked out a pearl-handled penknife. She stooped in a hurry to recover it, but it had fallen under a little table close to where Pauline Reynolds was sitting, and the latter picked it up instead. Hello. This is Janie Henderson's knife, exclaimed Pauline. Look here, Janie. Isn't this the one you lost? Of course it is, affirmed Janie. I can tell it by the small blade. There's a tiny piece broken off at the end. Where did you get it, Flossie? inquired. I found it when I was warden, replied Flossie. How should I know it was Janie's? You might have asked whose it was, said Maisie. You've no right to pocket things when you're warden. I wrote a found notice about it, declared Flossie. I never saw any notice, put in Janie. Where did you pin this wonderful paper? asked Pauline. On the dressing room door. Where nobody would ever dream of looking, returned Maisie. Why couldn't you put the knife on the forfeit tray? I really don't know. What's the use of making such an absurd fuss about trifles, said Flossie, linking her arm in Nora Palmer's, and turning away. I call them principles, not trifles, murmured Maisie. It's just on the same lines as the cribbing, not quite open and square. I wish Flossie had stayed at St. Bride's. I certainly don't consider her a credit to St. Chad's. The quarrels between Honor and Flossie occasionally rose to the level of a miniature war. The latter never lost any opportunity of flinging ridicule and contempt on all things Irish and Honor, who resented a slur on her native land more than a personal injury, could not keep her hot temper within bounds. It was, of course, very foolish to take any notice of Flossie's taunts, and so her friends reminded her, the more you blaze up. The more she'll tease, of course, said Maisie. Why can't you keep calm and pretend you don't hear her, said Pauline. She doesn't try it on with us. You're such a set of stolid Anglo-Saxons, declared Honor. You never get roused about anything. It's bad form, my dear girl. Hysterics are out of fashion. We don't go in for them at Chessington. But you really are entertaining when you're aggressively Celtic, Patty, said Lettuce. I own I can't resist taking a rise out of you myself sometimes, just for the fun of seeing you explode. You ought to have been born Red Indians, retorted Honor. I like people with a little fire. What's the good of having feelings if one's not to show them? You show them so hard, laughed Lettuce. You make yourself quite ridiculous. I'm sure I shouldn't think one of Flossie's silly jokes was worth making any fuss about. This was very excellent and practical schoolgirl wisdom. But unfortunately Lettuce preached a philosophy of stoicism to which honor had not yet attained. At the least provocation, her fiery Irish blood always asserted itself, and she would flare up, albeit she was conscious that, by so doing, she was affording her enemy the keenest satisfaction and was providing amusement for the other girls who enjoyed. Hearing Patty break out, one morning the feud came to a crisis. When Honor opened her desk, she found inside a neat little collection of new potatoes, and on the top, pinned to the biggest, a paper in Flossie's handwriting, bearing these lines, Honor's wish, O, oh, Aaron, moist Aaron, how damp are thy showers. I would I were back, mid thy pigs and thy rills, the tater to me is more dear than thy flowers, and I relish the rain on thy ever-wet hills. Honor could not help laughing at this, in spite of the aspersion on the climate of her country. Such a quip, however, could not go unrequited, and she sought for means of retaliation. She decided that Flossie deserved a booby trap and fled back early to the classroom after lunch to set it for her. It was a rather difficult and delicate operation, for she did not wish to catch anybody else by mistake. 
she balanced a big dictionary so that it rested on the top of the door and the lintel of the doorway then stationing herself inside the room she held the handle firmly lest someone should disturb her arrangement by flinging back the door which was just sufficiently wide open to allow a single person to enter she peeped every now and then into the passage on the lookout for flossie and admitted each returning girl with caution and due warning here she is at last whispered lettuce who was naughty enough to enjoy practical jokes and after admiring the preparations had offered to act scout is she really coming in next yes she's walking in front of may thurston and dorothea chambers are you certain absolutely then tell me when no honor pulled open the door and down crashed the dictionary tumbling full on the head not of flossy taylor but oh horrible miscarriage of justice of miss farrar herself at exactly the wrong moment the teacher had popped out of the next classroom and as flossy had stood politely aside to give her precedence she had walked straight into the trap destined for her pupil the dictionary was heavy and in its fall its sharp corner caught miss farrar on the cheek she stopped almost dazed by the sudden blow and pressing her handkerchief to her face drew it back marked with a red stain at the sight of the blood honor uttered a shriek and rushing from the room fled down the passage as if to escape from the horror of what she had done in almost a state of panic she ran across the quadrangle and turning into the garden sought refuge inside the tool shed here she was found some time afterwards by janie who had been sent to look for her and had vainly searched s t chad's and every other likely spot of which she could think honor never did things by halves if she wept she wept and at present she was a perfect niobe almost drowned in tears when she saw janie she gave her streaming eyes a hasty mop with a very wet pocket handkerchief have i killed her she asked in a tragic whisper of course not replied janie it was only a small cut on the cheek it's all right now it has been bathed with cold water i was afraid they'd bring it in murder groaned honor oh the ill luck of it that it should have been miss farrar and the dictionary came down with such a frightful bang i can never look her in the face again you'll have to said janie i was sent to fetch you back at once you needn't be afraid miss farrar has taken it so nicely poor honor's apologies and the depths of her genuine remorse would have melted the hardest of hearts much more that of her teacher we'll say no more about it declared miss farrar all the same remember that i cannot allow such things to happen in the classroom you might have hurt flossy very seriously no my scratch is nothing it will be healed directly but if you are really sorry honor you must give me your most solemn promise that you will never play such a dangerous practical joke again chapter seven s t chad celebrates an occasion during her first few days at chessington honor had considered the college as little better than a prison but as time went on and she grew more accustomed to the routine she began to reverse her opinion after all it was pleasant to have companionship the various fresh interests the many jokes amusements and constant small excitements inseparable from a large community of girls seemed to open out a new phase of existence for her i'd no idea what school was like before i came she confided to janie of course the boys were always talking of the things they did and of the fagging and bullying and ragging that went on but i was sure they were piling on the horror for my benefit and that it wasn't really as bad as they pretended why no one bullies at girls schools said janie i know they don't 
but Derek and Dermot stuffed me with all kinds of ridiculous tales just for the sake of teasing. They said that Chessington was exactly on the model of a boys' college, and that if girls learnt Latin and mathematics and played cricket and hockey and had a gymnasium and a debating society, it put such a masculine element into them that they couldn't refrain from using brute force instead of any other means of persuasion. They declared it was a natural sequence. And I must make up my mind to it. Derek even offered to teach me to box before I came as a useful accomplishment. Did you accept? No. Thank you. Not after the way I'd seen him knock Brian about. I suppose brothers are always teases. I've no experience because I haven't any brothers. I've nobody except mother, but she's as good as a whole family combined. When Janie mentioned her mother, her eyes always shone, and her face would light up. It was evident the two were everything to one another, and that the separation during term time was a hardship. I didn't want to go to school at all, continued honor, not, of course, because I believed Derek's absurd stories, but simply because I was so fond of home that I hated to leave. That's just how I felt. Mother and I had such a delightful time together, I was sure Chessington couldn't be half so nice. What used you to do? You've scarcely told me anything about your home, though I often talk about Kilmore. We live in quite a quiet place, began Janie. Though it's not so out of the world as Carrie. Our house is at Redcliffe, a village a few miles from Tuxminster. It's a beautiful country. There are lovely farms, with red-tiled roofs and big orchards and picturesque barns, and there's a splendid old castle overlooking the river. And then the trees. You ought to see our trees. These about Chessington look the most wretched, stunted things after our grand oaks and elms. It's a great fruit-growing neighborhood. We have heaps and heaps of apples and pears and plums and apricots in our garden. They're simply delicious when they're ripe. Then Tuxminster is so quaint. There are all kinds of funny little side streets, with cottages built at odd angles, and there's a market cross and several old churches, as well as the minster. Mother is extremely fond of painting, and sometimes she takes me out sketching with her. I can't draw very well yet. Most of my attempts are horrid daubs. But Mother is such a good teacher. She always makes one want to try. Hadn't you a governess? Asked Honor. Yes. Miss Hall used to come every day from Tuxminster, but I had a few lessons from Mother as well in drawing. And Greek history and English literature. We used to read books aloud in the evenings, Shakespeare or Dickens, or sometimes Tennyson or Wordsworth. We got through a tremendous amount of poetry in the winter, when it was dark early, and we had nothing else to do, except sit by the fire. We read all Marmion and the idols of the king and Lalaruk, as well as shorter pieces. Mother reads aloud most beautifully. It's delightful to listen to her. Then in summertime we used to go country walks and find wild flowers, and bring them back and hunt out their names in the botany book. I kept a nature calendar. And put down everything I noted, when the first violets were out, and when I heard the cuckoo, or saw a swallow for the first time in the year, and what birds' nests I found, or butterflies, or moths, or caterpillars. Sometimes I drew pictures of them as well. I had a whole row of specimen sheets pinned round the schoolroom at home. Then one day a wretched doctor told Mother that Tuxminster was too relaxing a place for me and recommended Chessington. I begged and implored not to be sent away. But Mother said the doctor was quite right and that I was far too grown up for my age and an only child ought to have young companions, so I must certainly go to school at once. I was absolutely miserable my first term. 
I'm a little more used to it now, but I begin to count the days to the holidays directly I get back to St. Chad's. There are still eight weeks before we break up. Janie spoke of home with the intense longing of a girl who is not naturally fond of the social side of life. She was out of her element at Chessington, and the strenuous bustle and stimulating whirl of the place, which began to mean so much to honor, were repugnant to her quiet reserved disposition. In every big school there are Janies, isolated characters not quite able to run the pace required by the inexorable code of public opinion. Interesting to the one or two who may happen to discover their good points, but to the mass of their companions merely names and faces in class. Some of them do fine work in the world afterwards, Yet the very qualities that help them to future success are not those to bring present popularity. They are not for the many, but for the few, and only show their best to an occasional friend whose sympathy can overstep the wall of shyness that fences them round. With honor alone, Janie was at her ease, and she would chat away in their bedroom with a sprightliness that would have amazed the other members of St. Chad's if they could have heard her. The two girls got on well together. Their opposite dispositions seemed to dovetail into one another, and so to cause little friction, and Miss Maitland, whose observant eyes noticed more than her pupils imagined, was well satisfied with the result of her experiment. Janie kept honor up to the mark in the way of work. She would generally go over dates or difficult points in the lessons while they were dressing each morning. And it was chiefly owing to her efforts that honor held a tolerably high place in her class. The latter often wished that she could have performed a like service for her friend in respect of athletics, but Janie was hopeless at physical sports and endured them only under compulsion. Every afternoon, from two o'clock till a quarter to four, all the girls were required to take part in organized games. Under the direction of Miss Young, the gymnastic mistress, they were allowed their choice between cricket and tennis. But during the specified hours, they must not be absent from the playing fields, as this systematic outdoor exercise formed part of the ordinary course of the school. Now and then it was varied by a walk, and occasionally by an archery or croquet tournament, but these were reserved for insufferably hot days, and the time, as a rule, was devoted to more active pursuits. The cricket pitch lay to the west of the college, a splendid, level tract of ground, commanding a glorious prospect of low, undulating hills, cliffs bordering a shingly beach, and the long, blue stretch of the channel beyond. All the healthy moorland and sea breezes seemed to blow there, filling the lungs with pure, fresh air, and well justifying Miss Cavendish's boast that Chessington was the most bracing place in the kingdom for growing girls. Even Janie's pale cheeks would take a tinge of pink as she ran. Unwillingly enough, in chase of a ball, and the majority of the school would come in at four o'clock flushed and rosy, and very ready indeed for the piles of thick bread and butter that awaited them in the various dining halls. Honor took to the games with enthusiasm. Having served an apprenticeship in the beginner's division at cricket, and having shown Miss Young her capacity in the way of batting and bowling, she was allowed a place in the ST. Chad's team. It happened that on the very day of her promotion her house played St. Hilary's, and there was great excitement about the match, because the latter was generally considered the crack team of the college. That afternoon, however, the Hilaryites did not quite justify their reputation. Perhaps the ST. Chad's bowling had been extra good. At all events, the street Hillary side was dismissed for 67. Honor's heart was beating fast when at length her innings arrived, and, taking her bat, she walked to the wicket. Every eye, she knew, would be fixed upon her play. 
a new girl, she was standing her trial before the school. And on the result of this match would largely depend her position during the term. She had played cricket during the holidays with her brothers, and all Derek's rules came crowding into her mind as she tried to imagine that she was on the dear, rough old field at home, with Brian de Bowl and Fergus for long stop, and Dermot and Osmond to field, and criticize her strokes afterwards. She held her bat well, keeping her left shoulder to the bowler and her eye on the ball. The bat was a light new one which the boys had given her as a parting present, and she felt she could wield it easily. During the first over she played steadily, but did not attempt to score. It was one of Derek's pet maxims that it was folly to try to do so until you had taken the measure of your opponent, and she wished to gain confidence. In the next over her partner, Chatty Burns made a single which brought honor to the opposite wicket. Gertrude Humphreys's bowling was more to her taste. It might be described as fast and loose and honor. Unlike most girls, did not object to swift bowling, having been accustomed to it from Brian and Derek. The first ball she received came down at a good pace, but well on the offside of the wicket. This was just the chance she had been waiting for, and a well-timed cut sent it flying to the boundary for three. The rest of the over was uneventful, Chatty having evidently made up her mind to be careful. Winnie Sutcliffe now took up the bowling at the other end, but her first ball, being a wide, served to increase the confidence that Honor had felt in breaking her duck. The next ball, though straight on middle stump, was a half volley. Honor stepped out to it with a feeling of exultation, and a moment later it was soaring over the bowler's head for four. Good. Well hit, Honor. St. Chad's forever. Hurrah! Ejaculated the Chadites. Success like this often turns the batter's head, but Honor remembered in time the many cautions she had received from her critical brothers. And the next ball, being of good length, she played quietly to long off for one. Chatty now received the bowling and, encouraged by Honor's success, made what the girls afterwards described as the finest leg hit they had ever seen. Certainly it was a good stroke, taken quite clean and square. And as it cleared the boards, it was marked down six amid rapturous applause. After that runs came more slowly for a time, and neither girl appeared inclined to take any risks. This careful play, however, began to wear down the bowling, especially Gertrude Humphreys's, which became decidedly loose. Honor, seeing her chance, suddenly began hitting about her with a spirit and vigor that almost sent the Chadites delirious with delight. While even Miss Young was seen laughing and smiling with Miss Maitland in a manner that seemed to imply no small self-congratulation on her choice for the last vacancy in the team. The Hillaryites were looking decidedly glum at this marked change in the fortunes of the game. Grace Ward, their captain, at the end of the over quietly rolled the ball to Ida Bellamy, famed for her slow twisters. Her first essay pitched well to the leg side, and Honor, who rather despised slows, made a mighty stroke at it, not allowing for the break, and missed it altogether. With her heart in her mouth, she glanced rapidly round at the wicket, expecting to see her bales fly, but luck was on her side. For the break had been a little too great, and the ball just cleared the off stump. A good thing Derek isn't here, said Honor to herself. I should never have heard the end of that. It was very hard to resist the temptation to hit out, dangerous though she knew it to be. And it was with a sensation of relief that she saw the ball traveling off for a single to long field, thus leaving the rest of the over to Chatty, who, neither so ambitious nor so impatient, 
played it out without giving them much long for chance of a catch. By this time sixty was up on the board, of which honor had contributed twenty-eight to the great satisfaction of all concerned. But Grace had not played her last card. She had evidently decided on a double change of bowling. For, when the fielders had crossed, Irene Richmond was seen at the wicket. Irene's bowling was peculiar. It was left-handed, which is quite uncommon in a girl. And the more difficult on that account, the Chadites looked at one another with smiles that were less spontaneous. Certainly Irene might with advantage have been put on before. Her style, though by no means swift, was most awkward to play. Chatty received the first ball, which beat her completely, though luckily it did not touch the wicket. A minute later she made a single, and Honor felt rather blank, as it was now her turn to face the bowling. One of Derek's pet rules, however, came into her mind, when you're in doubt. Watch each ball carefully, till you get your eye in, and by dint of adherence to this, she played out the over with safety. The slow bowling at the other end, though it looked so simple, was full of weird pitfalls, into one of which Chatty fell an easy victim. She played too soon at a short-pitched ball, and spooned a catch to Midon, who took good care not to drop it. Chatty retired rather ruefully, but was consoled by the applause she received from the pavilion, her twenty-three runs being regarded as a handsome contribution. Maisie Talbot came in next. Being tall and athletic for her age, she had a long reach, which she employed successfully in driving the first ball she received right along the ground in two. The country for three. This seemed to disconcert the bowler. The next one she sent down was an easy full pitch. Honor waited till just the right moment, and then, with a fine swing of her bat, sent the ball clean over the boundary for six, a performance that quite brought down the house, even the Hillaryites joining in the cheering. For a moment no one seemed to have realized how the score was going, but when seventy went up on the board there was a wild rush for the pavilion, for the match was won. Honor's friends were loud in their congratulations, and Janie, who had been an excited spectator, was almost as proud as if the success had been her own. Vivian Holmes herself actually expressed approval. Well played, Honor Fitzgerald, she said. I expect some day you'll be a credit to St. Chad's, as Vivian was generally more ready to squash. Newcomers then to encourage them, this was indeed high praise, and Honor felt inspired to continue her exertions. Having the white ribbon of the college team as the object of her ambition, great were the rejoicings of the Chadites at their triumph over St. Hilary's. Something in the way of a celebration seemed necessary to immortalize the occasion, and that evening, after a hurried conference among the elder girls, it was given out that. With Miss Maitland's permission, an impromptu fancy dress ball would take place in the recreation room at 8.30 precisely. We're just to come in any kind of costumes we can manage to contrive, said Lettuce Talbot, who, wild with excitement, had carried the thrilling tidings to the younger contingent. Miss Maitland is going to dress up, and so is Miss Parkinson. The cook is making some lemonade. I hope it will be cold in time, but even if it isn't, it will be rather nice hot. Oh, would you advise me to go as a flower girl? Or do you think Queen Elizabeth would be better? I should suggest a Mary Andrew at the present moment, said Ruth Latimer, as Lettuce, unable to contain her glee, went hopping round the room. You could easily put a different colored stocking on each leg, cut sheets of tissue paper to make a short, frilled, sticking-out skirt. Borrow the toasting fork from the kitchen and hang it with ribbons for your bauble, and there you are. Jolly, exclaimed Lettuce. 
I'll do it. Will you lend me your scarlet sponge bag? It would make the very cup I want. It was fortunate that Vivian Holmes and her fellow workers had reserved the announcement of the proposed fate until after preparation. Otherwise, very few lessons would have been learnt at St. Chad's. The girls finished supper with record speed and filed out of the dining hall at least ten minutes earlier than usual, all anxious to flee upstairs and begin the delightful but arduous task of robing themselves in character. Miss Maitland was the owner of what she called a theatrical property box. It held a store of most invaluable possessions, which she had collected from time to time and put by to serve for charades or tableaus. There were old evening dresses and cloaks, feathers, shawls, a few hats, artificial flowers, bright-colored scarves, beads, bangles, and cracker jewelry, even some false mustaches and beards, a horse pistol, and a pair of top boots. These she placed entirely at the disposal of the girls, telling Vivian Holmes to distribute them so as to allow as many as possible to have a share. Vivian was strictly impartial and doled out the treasures with the stern justice of a Roman tribune. They did not go very far, however, among forty Chadites, so of necessity. At least half of the costumes had to be composed hastily of anything that came to hand. The apparelling was a lively process. To judge from the sounds of mirth that issued from the various cubicles, and so many different articles were borrowed, lent, and exchanged that it was a wonder their respective owners ever managed to claim them again. Strict secrecy was observed, the occupants of each bedroom denying even a peep to their next-door neighbors, who, though full of their own preparations, could not fail to exhibit curiosity when such exclamations as, Oh, how lovely! or, It's simply screaming! were wafted down the passage. Nowhere was the excitement keener than in number eight. Though Honor and Janie had the fun all to themselves, the latter had decided to go as a friar. She had contrived a capital monk's habit out of her waterproof, tied round the waist with the cord that held back the window curtains. The hood formed the cowl, a dictionary made of very passable breviary, and a hockey stick served as a pilgrim's staff. You're just like a palmer returning from the holy land, declared honor. Or the friar of orders gray, said Janey, who walked forth to tell his beads. And he met with a lady fair clad in a pilgrim's weeds. I ought to have a rosary, but there isn't anything that would do in the least for it. Never mind. One must imagine it is in your pocket. Even palmers couldn't tell their beads all day long. You look a most unsuitable figure to dance. I'm afraid they would turn you out of your monastery if they caught you. Honor was determined to enact the part of Dick Turpin. She had corked herself the most ferocious mustaches and made a cocked hat out of brown paper, and was now only waiting for a certain cloak, the horse pistol, and the pair of top boots, which Vivian had promised to bring her if Barbara Russell, one of the elder girls, did not want them. I heard Barbara say she meant to be a shepherdess, she said, so she couldn't possibly wear top boots. I don't believe anybody else has thought of a highwayman. I wish Vivian would be quick. She was in a ferment of excitement. A festivity such as this was an event in her life. She could hardly bear to wait and would have been down the passage in search of the missing properties, only she did not wish to exhibit her beautiful mustaches before the right time. Vivian won't be long. Janie assured her, she is the most dependable person I know. When she says she'll do a thing, she does it. Oh, here she is now. Honor sprang to the door, but her face fell as she saw the monitress arrive empty-handed. I'm dreadfully sorry, announced Vivian. 
Barbara decided, after all, to be Oliver Cromwell, so of course she wanted the cloak. Boots and pistol. I've brought you a few bangles and a wreath of flowers, if they'll be of any use to you. I've nothing else left. I must fly. I've to get into my own costume. Per honor. It was a bitter disappointment. She had counted so much on representing Dick Turpin that to have to forego the part seemed little short of a tragedy. I can't do a highwayman in nothing but a pair of corked mustaches, she exclaimed dolefully. It is a pity, sympathized Janie, but of course it can't be helped. If we're very quick, we shall just have time to think of something else. Could you manage a fairy with the bangles and the wreath and a white petticoat? A fairy? No. Do I look like a fairy? I'm so cross it would have to be a goblin. I know what I'll do. I shall go as an Arab. With the towel's wound round you, I suppose? They're not big enough. I must use my sheets and honor. Suiting her action to her words, ruthlessly disarranged her bed. If the towels were too small, the sheets proved too large. In spite of Janie's efforts, much hampered by her cassock and cowl, they refused to drape elegantly. Honor lost all patience at last, and, seizing her scissors, ripped the offending sheets and halves with uncompromising fingers. Oh, Honor, what have you done? How could you? Oh, what will Miss Maitland say? shrieked Janie, almost in tears. I don't care, declared Honor recklessly. In her present excited state, she would have torn up her best dress with equal readiness. She was elated with her success in the cricket field. What the Scotch call, fay, and so long as she gratified her present whim, she had no thought at all for the future. I must have some costume, she continued, and we ought to go downstairs at once. They're my own sheets, so what does it matter? It isn't as if they were school property. I brought them from home with the rest of my linen. They're marked H. Fitzgerald, in the corner. You'll get into a shocking scrape. All the same, said Janie, who was horror-stricken at her friend's lawlessness. There was no time, however, to think about consequences. The gong was giving the signal for the parade to begin, and various gigglings and exclamations in the passage warned them that the other girls were already issuing from their rooms. Honor hastily finished her Arab toilet, and without further delay the pair joined the rest of the masqueraders in the hall. Here a brilliant scene awaited them. Considering the scanty materials at command, quite marvelous results had been accomplished. The costumes were most gay and varied, and many of them showed extreme ingenuity on the part of their wearers. Lettuce Talbot had carried out Ruth Latimer's idea for a Mary Andrew with great success, and was evidently endeavoring to sustain the character by firing off bad puns, or facetious remarks on the appearance of her friends. Dorothy Arkwright, in a blue evening dress and a black velvet hat with feathers, made a dignified Duchess of Devonshire. And Pauline Reynolds, whose long, golden hair hung below her waist, came arrayed as fair Rosamond. There were several Italian peasants, a cavalier, a roundhead, and a matador. Agnes Bennett, one of the elder girls, impersonated the Pied Piper of Hamelin. By pinning two dressing gowns, one of red and one of buff, together, she had well imitated the queer long coat from heel to head, half of yellow and half of red, worn by the mysterious stranger, and, with her pipe hung with ribbons at her lips, seemed ready to charm either rats into the weezer or children into the hillside. Edith Hammondsmith was a fairy, and Claudia a Pierrot, while Flossie Taylor in an eastern shawl, and with bangles tied on for earrings, looked a gorgeous Cleopatra. 
Chatty Burns, in a tartan plaid, made a typical Highland lassie. Effie Lawson, with her hair plaited in a tight pigtail, and her eyebrows corked aslant, had, with the aid of a colored bedspread and a Japanese umbrella, turned herself into a very creditable heathen chinny and Maisie Talbot, who found materials waxing scarce after she had finished arraying lettuce, had flung a skin rug over her shoulders, painted her face in streaks of red and black, and come as a savage. Adeline Vaughn had an original and rather striking costume. She called herself Scholastica and had decorated herself with a double row of exercise books, suspended by ribbons round her waist. Pencils, india rubbers, pens, and rulers were fastened to all parts of her dress, and a college cap, borrowed from Miss Maitland, completed the effect. The funniest of all, however, was Madge Summers, who represented a sausage. She had been elaborately got up for the part by her roommates. They borrowed a colored tablecloth from the kitchen, the reverse side of which was a pinky fawn shade. Then they patted Madge carefully all over, so as to make her the right shape, swathed her in the tablecloth, and fastened it down the back with safety pins, tying it tightly round her neck and ankles. She could scarcely manage to walk, much less dance. And she was so hot in her many wrappings that her face burned, so she assured her friends, as if she were already on the frying pan, but if she could not take an active part in the proceedings, she had the satisfaction of attracting an immense amount of attention. The girls chose partners in the hall and marched in procession into the recreation room where Miss Maitland, a stately Marie Antoinette, acted hostess and received her guests with the assistance of Miss Parkinson, a Spanish gypsy, and Vivian Holmes, hastily attired as a troubadour. It is indeed a carnival, said Miss Maitland. The costumes are splendid, and all deserve hearty congratulations. We shall have to take boats as to which is the best. We haven't thought of the music yet. It seems almost presumptuous to ask Queen Cleopatra to play a waltz for us, but perhaps she will condescend thus far. We can't ask the sausage, for she hasn't any arms. The troubadour and the pied piper ought to do their share, and the Mary Andrew must give us a posle. Everybody declared the evening to be the greatest success. The lemonade, fortunately cold, was delicious, and so were the biscuits that Miss Maitland, through lack of any other dainties, had provided as refreshments. Half past nine came far too soon, and the dancers, hot, flushed, and excited, were forced reluctantly to abandon the festivities and betake themselves upstairs to tear off their grandeur. Honor slept between the blankets that night, and her slumbers were haunted by a vision of Miss Maitland as an avenging specter arrayed in the mutilated sheets. The dream was certainly prophetic, for the house mistress was extremely angry on discovering the damage done and gave Honor a lecture such as she richly deserved. You will stay in from cricket today and mend the sheets, she decreed at the conclusion of the scolding. You will find them ready fixed by two o'clock. I shall expect the seams to be neatly run and the edges turned over and hemmed. Honor groaned. After the excitement of yesterday's match, she had been looking forward to the cricket practice. Moreover, she hated sewing. But there was no appeal. Each housemistress had authority to suspend games, if necessary, so she was compelled to pass a weary afternoon at a most uncongenial occupation. It's hard labor, she exclaimed, when Janie ran in at four o'clock. Finished. No, I've only run one seam and hemmed about six inches. I feel like the song of the shirt, only it's the song of the sheet instead. 
stitch, 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 and work, work, work. My fingers are getting quite weary and worn. There's one comfort at any rate. Miss Maitland won't be likely to keep me away from preparation. And as the clothes go to the wash tomorrow, perhaps she'll let one of the maids do the rest of this and give me some other penance instead. I'd rather learn five chapters of history or a scene from Shakespeare, and I'd welcome a whole page of equations, I would indeed. I'm afraid it's a vain hope, said Janey. Miss Maitland always sticks to her word. She proved right. Miss Maitland was inexorable. The discipline at Chessington was strict, and any mistress who gave an order was accustomed to enforce it rigorously. Honor was obliged to forego the triumphs of the playing fields until the very last stitch had been put in her sheets, a punishment which was severe enough. If not entirely to work a reform, at any rate to sober her considerably for the present. Chapter 8 A Mysterious Happening I Wonder How It Is Philosophized Ruth Latimer That one always seems to like some girls so much and detest others. There are certain people who, no matter what they do, or even if their intentions are good, always rub one up the wrong way. Natural affinity, or the reverse, I suppose, answered Maisie Talbot. I'm a great believer in first impressions. I can generally tell in five minutes whether I'm going to be friends with anyone or not, and I find I'm nearly certain to be right in the long run. I suppose I must have a natural antipathy. Then, against Flossie Taylor, confessed honor candidly. It didn't take me as long as five minutes to discover my sentiments towards her. I don't wonder, said Lettuce. Flossie is a bounder. What's that? Oh, Patty, you've lived at the back of beyond. A bounder means, well, just a bounder. Putting on side, you know. How particularly lucid and enlightening. It means someone who tries to make herself out of more consequence than she really is, explained Maisie. Flossie is continually dragging into her conversation the grand things she has at home and the grand people she stays with. She doesn't mention them naturally. As anyone might do without being offensive, said Ruth Latimer. She parades them just to show off, in a particularly obtrusive and objectionable manner. And we think that very bad taste at Chessington, because, of course, almost all of us have quite as nice homes and friends, only we don't care to boast about them. It looks as if you hadn't been accustomed to decent things, if you're always wanting to let people know you possess them, added Lettuce. The worst of it is, continued Maisie, that she's having a bad influence at St. Chad's. The Hammond Smiths and the Lawsons and the Palmers follow her lead implicitly, and she's completely spoiling Rhoda Cunliffe and Hope Robertson. They used to be quite different before Flossie came. I don't think Jesse Gray and Gladys Chesters have improved either lately. It seems such a pity, because we've always prided ourselves that St. Chad's was the best house in the college, and we don't want this kind of element to creep in. What can we do? asked Ruth Latimer. Suppose we form a league against it. All the nicer girls would join. And if Flossie and her set see that we really vote them bad style, perhaps they'll have the sense to drop it. All right. Put me down as your first member. What's the name of the society? We might call it the Anti-Bounders. It has a brisk, rolling sound that's rather jolly. The ABS for short, suggested Honor. And the rules, asked Ruth. Those could be short and sweet. Something on these lines. 1. No member is to make an unnecessary or ostentatious display of wealth or valuables. 2. No member is to brag constantly of high connections or titled friends. 3. Members are to consider, not money, but culture, as the standard of public estimation at St. Chad's, 
and to remember that the essence of good breeding is simplicity. 4. Any member transgressing any of these rules will be blackballed. Excellent, said Ruth. It puts what we mean in a nutshell. Now, we must write that out and try to get signatures. We might add a fifth rule about not doing sneaking tricks. It's decidedly necessary. And our motto could be noblesse oblige, proposed honor. The anti-bounders. Met with favor among a large proportion of the Chadites, but with much derision from Flossie and her friends, who lost no opportunity of ridiculing the League. Nicknamed its members the Pharisees and threw open scorn upon its rules. Nevertheless, in spite of their opposition, the society was strong enough to work a decided improvement, particularly among a certain section who were ready to trim their sails according to the prevailing wind and to follow blindly the general consensus of public opinion. In future, any girl guilty of inordinate bragging was christened, chanticleer, and a warning, cock a doodle do, would advise her of the fact without further explanation. It's quite enough, said Maisie. We don't want to rub it in too hard, but just to let them see that we notice. Jessie Gray is better already. And although Flossie and Claudia make so much fun of us, they're really extremely nettled because they thought themselves the absolute perfection of good style. And it has been a great blow to them to discover that three quarters of the house consider them bad form. It was a constant annoyance to Maisie, let us, and Pauline that Flossie should occupy the fourth cubicle in number 13 bedroom, and they often wondered why Miss Maitland had placed so uncongenial a companion in their midst, especially when Adeline Vaughn is with the Hammondsmiths in number 10, said Lettuce. If we might only make an exchange, everybody would be satisfied. Miss Maitland, however had reasons for her arrangements, which she did not care to explain. She knew far more of the inner life of the house than the girls suspected, and hoped that by a judicious sandwiching of different elements certain undesirable traits might be eliminated and the general tone raised, though she was often aware of things that were not entirely to her satisfaction, she was wise enough not to interfere directly but by careful tactics to allow the Reformation to work from within. Experience having taught her that codes fixed by the girls themselves were twice as binding as those enforced by the authorities. The bedrooms at St. Chad's were on two floors, nos. 9 to 16 being on the upper story, and numbers 1 to 7 on the lower. Number 8, occupied by Honor and Janie, was the higher of two small rooms built over the porch, and occupied a position midway between the two floors, being reached by a short flight of steps from the landing below. In number four slept Evelyn Fletcher, the youngest girl in the house. She shared the room with an elder sister and two cousins, all three members of the sixth form. Though Evelyn was thirteen, she was very small and childish for her age, and was treated rather as a pet by the Chadites. She was a pretty little thing, with appealing blue eyes, fluffy hair, and a helpless, dependent manner. It was the great trial of her life that she was obliged to go to bed more than an hour before the other occupants of number four. She had a morbid horror of being alone in the dark, a horror that through a sensitive dread of being laughed at, she had so far confessed to no one, but which, all the same, was very real and overwhelming. Night after night she would lie with the curtain of her cubicle half-drawn and the door ajar so as to catch a gleam of light from the landing, listening with every nerve on the alert for she knew not what, and enduring agonies until the welcome moment when her sister Meta came upstairs. It was, of course, very foolish. But her terror was probably due to a dangerous illness from which she had suffered some years before, and which had left a permanent delicacy. 
one evening the younger girls had retired as usual and everything was very quiet in the upper stories evelyn lay with wake sometimes straining her ears to catch a sound from the ground floor below and sometimes burying her head in her pillow suddenly she sat up in bed with wide open terror-stricken eyes on the opposite wall there gleamed a strange dancing light which appeared and disappeared and reappeared again flickering faintly from floor to ceiling there seemed no explainable origin for it and evelyn's mind at once turned to the supernatural a silly maidservant at home had been accustomed to ply her with ghost stories all of which now recurred to her memory what was it that unnatural luminous halo on the opposite wall it was moving nearer to her and had almost reached the curtain of her cubicle when with a choking little gasp she sprang out of bed and darting into the corridor ran shrieking upstairs her one idea being to escape from the mysterious apparition her screams not only roused all the girls on the higher rooms but brought up vivian holmes who had been crossing the hall at the moment and felt it her duty as monitress to go and investigate what's all this noise about she asked evelyn what's the matter has anything frightened you it's something on my wall panted evelyn something white that moves what was it like i don't know i can't describe it perhaps it was a ghost said honor in a hollow voice they come softly this way and pulling a horrible face she moved slowly forward with a gliding motion her white nightdress completing the illusion trembling from head to foot evelyn turned and clung to the monitress stop that honor exclaimed vivian sharply it's a wicked thing to frighten anybody come along evie i'll go with you to your room and we'll try to find out what this mysterious something is go back to bed at once all the rest of you after making a thorough inspection of number four vivian found that the uncanny light was after all very easy of explanation it was nothing but the reflection from a lamp outside and the swaying of the blind had been responsible for the movement having shown evelyn the unromantic origin of her spectre the monitress left her apparently pacified and went downstairs in the upper rooms all was soon in absolute stillness the girls took vivian's advice and retired to bed again laughing at having been disturbed for so trivial a cause evelyn fletcher is a goose said flossie taylor she'd run away from her own shadow she is rather silly agreed maisie talbot i've no patience with people who imagine ghosts maisie's own nerves were of the stoutest she certainly could not sympathize with superstitious fears and neither flickering lights nor possible spectres would have distressed her in the least when people shriek at nothing and rouse the whole house they deserve to have something to shriek at remarked flossie but maisie was in the act of hopping into bed and only grunted in reply while pauline and lettuce were already half asleep flossie lay for a minute or two pondering over the affair then got up again very softly first she felt on her washstand for her tooth powder and dabbed her face plentifully with it till she was sure it must be white all over then she took the towel and arranged it over her head to hide her hair in every bedroom at st chad's there were a candle and a box of matches in case the electric light should suddenly fail flossie groped for these and found them and taking them in her hand left the room on tiptoe where are you going asked maisie drowsily but receiving no reply she did not even trouble to open her eyes once outside the door flossie lighted her candle she was determined 
in spite of Vivian's warning, to play a trick upon Evelyn. She needs teasing out of such rubbish, she said to herself. Vivian Holmes always makes an absurd fuss of her, quite spoils her, in fact. I think the best way to cure people is to laugh at them. Creeping softly downstairs, she switched off the electric light at the end of the lower landing and, shading her candle with her hand, passed along in the darkness to number four. Without pausing a moment, she entered, holding up one arm in a dramatic attitude and making her eyes glare wildly from her whitened face. The effect was beyond all that she had anticipated. Such a scream of agonized fear came from the bed in the corner that, alarmed at what she had done, Flossie turned and fled. As she ran through the door, she realized that somebody was hastening along the dark passage and, afraid of being discovered. She turned suddenly and rushed up the short flight of steps that led to Honor's bedroom, blowing out her candle as she went. She crouched for a few moments outside the door of number eight, then, hearing no footsteps pursuing her, she ventured to steal down again and make a dash for the stairs and the upper landing, where she whisked into number thirteen with all possible speed. It was a narrow shave, she said to herself. If that was Vivian and she had caught me, I expect she'd have made herself uncommonly disagreeable. In the meantime, Vivian had returned to the recreation room and told the story of Evelyn's groundless fears to the elder girls assembled there. A shock of this kind is extremely bad for Evie, said Meta. She had a nervous fever four years ago and has been so fragile and highly strung ever since. She was sent to Chessington because we hoped the bracing air might do her good. I remember she used to have night terrors when she was a wee child, but we thought she had quite got over them. She looks very white and delicate, said Vivian. She's all eyes. If she were my sister, I should like to see her less nervy. Perhaps I had better run upstairs to her, said Meta, rather anxiously. Now I think of it. I remember she always seems most relieved when May and Trissy and I make our appearance at 9.30. Meta found the landing in total darkness, a most unusual occurrence, as the electric light was always left on there. She felt her way along by the wall, and as she did so she was aware of somebody coming towards her from the opposite end of the long corridor. Whoever it was carried a light in her hand, so small as to make only a faint glimmer, but enough to allow Meta to perceive that she turned into number four. The next moment a cry of frantic fear issued from the room. Meta hurried forward, her heart throbbing wildly, while the figure, rushing from the room, and showing in its hasty flight a white-veiled head, darted up the steps to number eight and disappeared, light and all. It did not take Meta more than three seconds to reach her sister's bedside. Strangled sounds issued from under the clothes, where Evelyn lay cowering in mortal terror, and again, as Meta placed her hand on the bed, came that convulsive, half-stifled cry. Evie, Evie dear, don't you know me? exclaimed Meta, realizing at last who stood near, Evelyn sat up and flung her arms round her sister. She was in a most agitated, hysterical condition, trembling and quivering with sobs. Meta soothed her as well as she could and requested Vivian, who had followed to see that all was right, to switch on the bedroom light, and also the one in the passage. Someone must have intentionally turned it off, she said, on purpose to play this trick. I know I'm silly, choked Evelyn. More reassured now that the room was no longer in darkness, but I can't help it. I really thought it was a ghost. Who is responsible for this? asked Vivian indignantly. Honor Fitzgerald, replied Meta 
without hesitation. Are you sure? Whoever it was ran back into number eight. Janie Henderson would never dream of doing such a thing, so it must have been honor. She certainly was pretending to be a ghost upstairs, said Vivian. I shall go and tell her my opinion of her, and she departed with a very grim expression on her face. Janie and Honor were half asleep when Vivian, like an avenging angel, entered number eight. Look here, Honor Fitzgerald, she began, if you try any more of those senseless practical jokes, I shall report you to Miss Maitland. I'm monitress here, and I don't intend to have this kind of thing going on at St. Chad's. What's the matter? asked Honor, rubbing her eyes. Matter, indeed. You know as well as I do. It was a cruel, mean trick to play upon a nervous, delicate girl like Evie Fletcher. Honor was considerably astonished. She, of course, knew nothing of Flossie's escapade and imagined that the monotrust must be referring to the few words she had said on the upper landing. Why? Evie didn't seem to mind all that much. She retorted. You frightened her most seriously, and I consider it so dangerous that I'd rather you were expelled from the school than that it should happen again. I don't want to get you into trouble at headquarters if I can help it, so I'll say nothing if you'll promise me faithfully that this is absolutely the last time you'll ever act ghost. Of course I'll promise. I didn't intend to upset Evie. I think both you and she are making a great fuss about nothing, replied Honor, lying down once more. I'm disgusted with you. Honor Fitzgerald, if you can't realize the mischief your thoughtlessness has done, you might at least have the grace to be sorry for it. To amuse yourself by playing on the fears of a timid girl, younger than you, is the work of a coward. Yes, a coward. That's what I consider you, and Vivian turned away, full of righteous wrath. And wondering whether she had adequately fulfilled her monitorial duty, or whether she ought to have said even more. Chapter 9 Diamond Cut Diamond Honor was both amazed and indignant at Vivian's stern rebuke. She appealed to Janie in self-justification. I don't understand it, she declared. I only screwed up my face and said ghosts glided. I stopped at once when Vivian asked me. How could Evelyn have been so fearfully frightened just at that? I can't imagine, said Janie. Except that she's such an extremely nervous girl. It's too bad to blame me on that account. Vivian is generally very severe. She's always down on me. I'm continually in hot water and half the time I don't know exactly why. It was not until the next afternoon that Honor learned of the practical joke that had been practiced upon her schoolfellow. As she was washing her hands in the dressing room, she chanced to overhear a few remarks between two or three girls who were discussing the affair and at once questioned them about it. Of course Meta knew it was you, Honor, said Ruth Latimer, rather reproachfully. Why, of course, asked Honor, because it couldn't be anyone else. You're always playing tricks upon someone. It's a case of give a dog a bad name, then. I'm innocent for once. But the ghost ran up the steps to number eight. That's only circumstantial evidence. I certainly didn't do it. Janie can tell you that I never left the bedroom. Yes, I could take my oath in a law court as a reliable witness, vouched Janie. Then who was it? Honor shook her head. Ask me a harder. She said briefly. Flossie, who was standing near, looked rather conscious, but volunteered no explanation. It's a most peculiar thing, said Ruth. Somebody must have been the ghost. I suppose. Unless it were a real one, suggested Flossie. It might, what nonsense. Nobody believes in ghosts, except, perhaps, Evelyn, interrupted Ruth scornfully. Of course. It was a girl playing a trick. The only question is, who? Could it be May or Trissy Turner, suggested Flossie. 
impossible evelyn's own cousins and in the sixth form too it's very extraordinary it ought to be properly cleared up said lettuce talbot suppose we ask every girl in the house if she knows anything proposed dorothy arkwright no meta begged us to let the matter drop replied ruth she says evelyn is extremely sensitive about it and can't bear the subject alluded to evelyn looked very ill this morning observed dorothy yes meta says she has had a severe shock and the least reference to it might upset her again so it will have to remain unexplained i suppose so said flossie it seems a complete mystery why flossie exclaimed maisie talbot suddenly didn't i hear you get up last night after vivian had gone downstairs and we had marched off to bed again i remember i called out to you but i was too sleepy to wake up properly i verily believe it must have been you who frightened evelyn honestly now was it flossie turned very red she would have continued to shield herself at honor's expense if it had been any longer possible but she was not prepared to tell a direct falsehood there was no way out of it but to confess what a storm in a teacup she replied shrugging her shoulders it's absurd if one can't play the least joke without a monitress interfering and making a ridiculous fuss it was only meant for fun i should have laughed if anybody had done it to me